Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Good morning to day two of Clean Air EU, Clean Air Forum 2019. Two years ago, we were all to, many of us were here together in Paris. And how far have we come since then? And where do we go now? Two years ago, we weren't talking about climate emergency. I don't think a lot of people were saying health emergency. But if you think about these 400,000 people dying of premature, dying premature deaths every year, in some countries, it's hit even harder. Poland, 41,000, 44,000, 11% of total. We've got things to fix. And, for the, and over the last day, we were talking about the agriculture aspect. We we're talking um, about the health aspect, uh, about the heating aspect. How do we pay for this? How do we pay for this? And where do we go from here? Uh, looking ahead to dealing with that and also dealing with the climate. We've got COP25 coming next month and health is part of that. Um, let's talk local first, thinking global and acting locally. Um, and before I get to our first guest, hashtag clean, e, clean air EU. And we were tweeting like beasts yesterday, as I had suggested. It was trending yesterday on EU topics uh, before COP25 hijacked us. But maybe we can make it trend again today with more of your comments. That would be great. Okay, let's begin with a man who is an architect, urban, urban activist, musician, lived in New York City, in London, in Italy. He is the mayor of Bratislava. Matus Valo. Matus, where are you? Yes, welcome. A big hand to Matus. Please, yeah. Thank you very much. And of course, welcome all of you in Bratislava. It's the best city in the Europe. For one of the best cities, okay. Uh, dear participant of EU Clean Air Air Forum Conference, we are currently facing the challenge of confronting one of the biggest environmental threats of our time. This is, our, this is why I would like to appeal to all of you that we join forces to combat air pollution in, on, at European, national, and of course on local levels. But in particular, we should all ask our questions what each and every one of us is doing to improve the environment. Why uh, is the situation in Bratislava, what is the situation in Bratislava today? When the monitoring station in Bratislava reported exceeding limits uh, values, the Bratislava district attorney was uh, tasked with preparing an integrating program for improving air quality, which was completed in the end of uh, 2016. At the beginning of 2017, the city government updated the integrated program for improving air quality, which was intended to introduce effective measures to reduce air pollution by harmful substances below permitted limits. But the document did not provide for measurable, appraisable and time-specific measures and did not comply with either the Clean Air Act or the European legislation. Yes, it is important to have a clear legal uh, definition of the responsibilities related to the regulation of pollution sources, such as transport industry or householding heating. According to the decision issued by the Bratislava Regional Court in 2018 on a complaint of environmental NGOs uh, alleging the, uh, uh, the violation of applicable Slovak and European legislation in Bratislava integrated uh, program for improving air quality. It is again up to the district attorney authority to prepare a new version of the program. The city government is working on an updated version of the integrated program that will include clearly defined measures and indicators. We are also exploring the ways to obtain more information about the state of environment and of the air and to convey the information to the city residents in an accessible and intelligible manner. We are speaking with responsible state administration bodies. We are looking for partners in the academia 
and we are also consider the following the example of the city of Brno, which owns and operates the monitoring stations. But as I already said at the beginning, in order to be able to contribute to changing the situation in the long run, we must also change the way in which we behave. If we want Bratislava to be a city uh, which is good for living and in this context for breathing freely in the literal meaning of the word, we need to change our perspectives and focus on creating a sustainable transport system. Cars are clearly the biggest air pollut uh, polluter and their number in our capital is extremely high and rising. We are taking steps to improve public transport to make people prefer it over individual transport, which is a very difficult and long-run task. We have started to apply the tools to the transport field that enable to improve air quality gradually. That involves measures aimed at improving and strengthening public transport. Other measures unpopular with drivers uh, but equally, ne equally necessary are aimed at regulating individual car transportation for instance by, instance by developing and implementing a parking policies or by giving priority to the public transport, including reserved bus land at the expense of individual transport or building a bicycle lines. All the po uh, policies which are working in every other bigger European city. A specific theme is the education of us, the city inhabitants toward taking a greater interest in our living environment and increasing uh, our awareness. Let me stress once again that the only way to contribute to living in a healthier environment is to change our behavior and habits. We are taking steps to make transport efficient, integrated and environment friendly. It is up to us to decide what use we will make of our public uh, space. Whether we will have four lane roads, thus making the streets unsuitable for people except for those sitting in the cars, whether we will reduce the space available for the cars in favor of expanding green areas and creating safe and pleasant areas for cyclists and pedestrians. We realize that in order to make people more willing to use public transport and bicycles, it is the task of the city management to ensure that public transport is easily accessible, fast, clean and safe. If we want more people to ride bikes, bikes to move around the city, we need safe and well-separated cycleways without barriers. In short, in order to take a comprehensive approach to transport, as the biggest contributor to air pollution, it is the first of all necessary to strengthen the cooperation among all responsible actors, the city, the self-governing region and the government. We have a difficult and responsible long-term task ahead of us, but I'm confident that together we shall make it. We must do everything to prevent further, further deterioration of our air quality. The human population is responsible for safeguarding living condition on the earth, on the earth for all organisms. If you want to as assume this responsibility, we must start from ourselves and demonstrate our new attitude to and our new conduct with respect to nature and environment, we must lead by example. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Stay there one second. Stay there one second. Um, there was a, a, a New York Times article, you should read it, uh, just in the last couple of weeks. Um, with the headline, Long Overlooked Bratislava Shines with Newfound Cool, and you're in it. Yeah. <laughs> and they talk about how you've helped to earmark millions for new green spaces. I hope they're not lying on this. Uh, no, not, not so much. Not it's, so it's much. Very close okay. To All right. We're and, working uh, on it. And you have a contest to design bicycle stands. Yeah, of course, we, we are, we are uh, having context to design own bench, of course. Yes. Bicycle stand and garbage bin. But, but doesn't this, this isn't, uh, we were talking about this yesterday, about getting the public, citizens involved. And isn't that part of it, to give them kind of a stake and to show, uh, to get them involved in this sort of uh, transition and also to show them the payoff, that if they have these green spaces 
And if we try to find a way to have fewer cars uh, in urban areas so we have less pollution, they, so they, they will see the payoff and they will want this to happen, right? Yeah, I, I think that's the only way. To, to see them, the, the, to see the, our citizens, the, 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 the policies we are, we are translating into the reality are working. And it's quite difficult because it's, uh, to make a new bus line is not a very popular way because it's always mm -hmm. pushing out drivers in the cars. And, 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 and it's very good for Bratislava, it's not very good for me as a politician, but I care more for Bratislava than for my career. So. Very good. Mr. Mera, thank you very much. Thank you thank very you, much. Thank you. Great. Great. Thank you. Now let's talk, um, now let's think and act globally. Um, you know, the, the Paris Agreement for Climate Change was a milestone, um, but it doesn't really have any teeth. These are targets. But the UN has also engineered something on air pollution that has binding targets. It's called the Gothenburg Pro Protocol. And it is something that I want to talk about with Olga Algeyarova, Olga, uh, Executive Secretary of the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, UNESE. Please. Welcome. Um, Olga, let me first talk, because um, you have a whole long speech, but I think and we talked about this last night. Maybe we can talk it. Let's see if we can do this. Go ahead. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and if you need to, you can refer to your speech. But what, uh, this is uh, very interesting because this uh, UN, Air Air, UN Air Convention is 40 years old, now has 51 countries. And this updated Gothenburg Protocol, which started uh, as something to uh, fight acid rain, right? And it has now entered into effect in this new version as of last month, because you had Europe and you had North America signing this. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. Okay, Chris, uh, thank you for a good question. And uh, first of all, let me thank the organizers for organizing this very important uh, conference, because uh, it, it's also very timely, exactly why you are telling that. Uh, the Gothenburg Protocol that you are asking about is indeed a daughter or son of the of the Air Convention. Mm -hmm. uh, the Air Convention is a conventional long-range transboundary pollutants. Yep. Uh, and we have this convention since 1979 and indeed in two weeks we are going to celebrate 40 years in Geneva. So you are warmly welcome to come and celebrate with us. Indeed, uh, it is conflicting with uh, COP25, what I'm very sorry, but we didn't, we didn't intend to go to Chile, to Santiago to celebrate. So now it's in Madrid and we celebrate in Geneva. So this is the... You can take a train this time. Right? Uh, yeah, yeah, I will. But uh, <laughs> celebration of, of uh, our air convention is in Geneva. Okay. So since 1979, this convention has got eight protocols. And the uh, Gothenburg Protocol is the most recent of them. Yes. Uh, it started with heavy metals, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, carbon dioxide, with, with uh, sulfur, with nitrogen. And the Gothenburg Protocol uh, that uh, we have since 1999, the original one, uh, is, uh, as you mentioned correctly, uh, against acidification. And indeed, it already achieved some successes since that time. And in uh, 2012, there were some amendments, and it is really breakthrough, mm -hmm. uh, new uh, approach, because we are taking all them, all those harmful substances uh, in one. So it's like multi-pollutants protocol, this mm -hmm. amendment. And uh, th what is specific you want to tell me about PM 2.5, right? Yes, okay. pa particulate <laughs> matter 2.5, for those yeah. of you who don't know, right? And that's the, that's the stuff that, yeah. that people choke on in the cities, especially, right? Exactly. Uh, so what is PM 2.5? Is a fine particulate matter that we breathe, and it's so dangerous. Uh, one part of it is, for instance, the soot. Uh, so we don't realize, if we imagine our hair is 70 or 90 PM, uh, so 
and it is 2.5 micrometers particulate matter, so very fine, and it is first ever inclusion of such a fine particulate matter into some legally binding international agreement. So uh, it, it's yeah. finer than it's finer than your hair. Uh, indeed, very much okay. finer. This is very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, to be correct, the hair is 50 to 70 micrometers, sand is uh, 90, and yes. we are speaking about 2.5. So it seems like that's sort of an anodyne thing, it doesn't matter, but yeah. it does. Uh, very much so. Yeah, yeah. Um, and in this agreement, what I saw, and I saw a lot of different you know, statistics, to cut, it cuts, it, it commits countries to cutting particulate matter up to 80%. I saw 80%, uh, some of them. You know, the countries made their commitments uh, coming out of their specific situations, but really the, the cuts of some countries are very much significant. Uh, I have some numbers here. Uh, for Cyprus, it is 46%. Okay. You know, Netherlands, for instance, 38%, and so on and so on. So it's really significant. If we are able to do that, it would be good for everybody in the region. Now, as a result of this, you're, you're claiming that you have added a year of life expectancy oh, yeah. for Europeans. Really? Uh, this is not me or the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe who is claiming that, but we publish, you can read it whole. Okay. Uh, it is a scientific re report. Uh, 2016. Yeah. That is really claiming that due to our air convention since 1979 and to the put some sailings and uh, monitoring and reporting of our member states to the harmful substances in, in the air, we were able to prolong life expectancy in the region by 12 months, what is indeed one year. But plus, we improved the, the process of acidification. Indeed, some, uh, some fisheries where the fishes were indeed not living anymore mm -hmm. are again uh, alive. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, another, I mean, you talked about transboundary. Mm -hmm. And I think what is interesting here too is that uh, uh, and I saw also for even for Slovakia is that a lot of the pollution that Slovakia deals with is not from Slovakia. It comes from other countries. It's trans that's why we need a trans this transboundary agreement and others like it uh, to really cut pollution for everybody. That's the only way it's going to work, right? I'm a little bit sorry, Chris, that you spoke about uh, national or local versus global, but we have we, we are regional. <laughs> mm -hmm. Regional, okay. we, we speak about the uh, Euro-Asian region, what is uh, 56 countries, and these are the, our member states, they are 56. And what also the scientific research 2016 found out is that uh, we can act locally. I don't know, in cities we can address the movement of diesel motors or some industries or some burning fires, but uh, you have the most dangerous thing is so-called background pollution. Yeah. So it means that it's blown out from, from outside of the city. And you know, the, the, these uh, harm, har, harmful substances, they can travel long distances. Yes. Uh, so it's not enough to act locally. It's not enough even to act nationally. Yeah. And I believe it's not enough to act regionally because, you know, the problem of Beijing, for instance. So they are really able to travel long distances and we need to work together. Okay, yeah. and, then, and then one other point I think is uh, important among the others that you uh, have there is, that, is, is financing because that's going mm. to be our, our first panel. How do we finance this? <laughs> um, frankly, UNEC is not financing uh, the activities of its member states because uh, they are taking just commitments. We are creating the platform, some uh, knowledge hub and uh, expertise, uh, and this is on behalf of member states to, to cope with their commitments. Of course, we come to the country, we can advise, we, we can help them to sit at one table, to share experiences. We have some additional sources uh, on capacity building in namely eastern part of Europe or southeastern or in Central Asia that we, that, that we help. The EU is our biggest donor, on, uh, frankly speaking, on environmental activities. And uh, this is how we can help our member states. But 
indeed all these conventions, protocols, standards and norms must be implemented on, at the national level. Uh, it, it's very good uh, if uh, the member states could have it in their budget lines, mm -hmm. you know, specifically for clean or healthy air, uh, because then it's, you know, you can address, address it more specifically. And, and let me ask you too, though, is this, this Gothenburg Protocol, it, it is binding. It's binding, right? It's binding, yeah. Now, how come we can't do this on a climate level? How come that doesn't work that way? We could do it with the Gothenburg for particulate matter. Maybe in for, 40 years, maybe, you know, it's not easy. It takes time. Yeah, it takes and time. that with the acid, the acidification or the acid rain, yeah. we saw that it worked, we reduced, right? Absolutely, yeah, you can read it in the scientific You, you had results. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So maybe this could be a model for others, for other agreements. Well, it's not easy, but... Uh, look I don't want to commit you, but... <laughs> 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 Olga. Anything else you want to add? Did, did we cover most of what your points? I wanted to tell maybe one of my last thought. First of all, we speak about SDG, Sustainable Development Goal 3. Sustainable Development Goals, three. yeah. But, but yeah. This is number three on health and well-being. Okay. Uh, this is important for us, for Agenda 2030. And uh, you mentioned in many of your panels the cost of polluted air. Yeah. And maybe you mentioned the number. We speak in our region about 1.3, 1.4 billion, uh, sorry, trillion uh, dollars. Yeah. So it's a tremendous cost. Is in some countries is uh, the cost of that of the fatalities or deaths and um, diseases is almost 20 percent of GDP in some countries, you know. In Slovakia, I was reading the number yesterday is about 7.5% of GDP, it's quite a lot. But cost of implementation might be 0.01% of GDP. So let us consider uh, the cost of implementation of our instruments, conventions mm -hmm. and protocols compared to the cost to the national budgets and to the wallets of the people. Isn't it a shame that uh, we have to wait for it to start hurting and, and costing before we actually mm. do the band-aid effect and, uh, and, and try to fix it when it's too late? Um, that sounds familiar to, yeah. to the climate issue as well. But maybe this prise de conscience, as you might mm. say in French, uh, and fora, fora like this one, uh, may help to raise the consciousness that we need to act now. Yeah, exactly. So join us on celebrating and join us in our work and thank you for your attention. Have a nice day. Thank you, Olga. Thank you. So now let's start with our first panel and we are talking about money. Uh, funding clean air measures. Uh, could our uh, panel please uh, take your seats first. Um, improving cohesion, mainstreaming clean air and supporting the economy. Uh, how is funding productive without being counterproductive? Are we funding certain things that are defeating us in other areas? What about burden sharing? What about just transition? How do we avoid more gilets jaunes? How do we make everybody think that they're getting something out of this? That's tricky. Uh, let's see what we can do. We solve the world problems by this panel. Um, let me begin with Marc Lemaitre, Director General, DG Regional and Urban Policy, Regio, European Commission on EU Investment in Cleaner Greener. Cleaner Greener. Marc, please, a few opening comments and then you will join. Bienvenue. Merci. Chris, thank you very much. Um, dear State Secretaries, um, Executive Secretary, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, but above all, I think, um, colleagues, friends, and, uh, and citizens. Um, I liked what I heard <laughs> until now, and I'd like to continue with this word, I think, with which um, humanity uh, is always a bit uneasy and possibly feels like having a bad conscience, money. 
Um, and I'd like to start by a um, hard-hitting but spot-on, I think, uh, quote by an American scientist called uh, Guy McPherson. He said, if you think the economy is more important than the environment, try holding your breath while counting your money. And I think it's a perfectly fitting quote for a clean air forum uh, altogether. We do not want to hold our breath. We want to breathe uh, with the confidence that uh, this is not, not only a natural act, but that this is in fact good for our health uh, to, to breathe. And today, as I think um, European citizens in particular uh, are realizing um, this is not a given and they want change. And they have shown that they want change through notably the way they expressed their preferences in the last elections to the European Parliament. We have seen a very strong increase of support for political movements which put environmental concerns, climate concerns at the center of their uh, programs. And this is now being translated into a new European executive which is taking shape and which will be taking up office as a new European uh, Commission uh, two days from now, um, it is being translated very concretely. The new president of the European Commission, Ms. Ursula von der Leyen, has put sustainability, I would say, right at the core of the program which she intends to push um, with the European Commission over the coming five years. And she has labeled it European Green Deal. What I would want to emphasize is, in fact, what she already stressed as well this week in front of the European Parliament, that in fact this is not about the environment versus the economy. It is about reconciling the economy with the environment. And it is about, as she put it, in fact, designing a new growth strategy uh, through this uh, European uh, Green uh, Deal. Very specifically, she has already indicated, we were talking about you know, targets and whether they have teeth, etc. Well, in Europe, they do have teeth. Um, she already indicated that on climate, we need to raise our ambition. For now, we had set on uh, the objective of cutting uh, CO2 emissions by 40% by 2030. She said we need to go to at least 50% and possibly even to uh, 55. And I raise this because obviously you cannot dissociate climate action from air pollution. They are most often two sides of exactly the, uh, the same uh, coin. Um, but this, yes, is much easier said than done. It's easy to set targets. It's also very easy to miss them. And in fact, as you know, we have already targets for 2020, which is tomorrow, which is about cutting emissions by 20%. Um, we will get there overall. Not all member states will get there. So some will already miss these much more modest targets which we had set. Um, but we will get there also, we should remember, um, in inverted commas, thanks to uh, the deepest uh, recession uh, we have known uh, since uh, the Second World War. Uh, so clearly, it will not be a walk in the park. We will have to be extremely uh, determined. Now, what do we see today? Um, today, we see, if I take what is the biggest investment budget 
um, coming through the European budget, which is cohesion policy, um, I see that there is some focus on those um, environmental matters and on um, air pollution um, in, in particular. But what I see as well, and I won't bother you with, um, with graphs and so on, which had been, pre oh, they are there. Mm. <laughs> they, they are intruding. I hate PowerPoint presentations, so um, <clears throat> forgive me if I just neglect what, um, what I have in my, in my back there. But basically, what, what this says is that um, air pollution fighting investments um, in a direct way, you know, like uh, technologies in order to make sure that the gas emissions from whatever power plant or, uh, or waste incinerator, etc., are uh, reduced, um, this makes up about 2 billion euros of a cohesion policy which represents 350 billion euros and 2 billion euros to be divided up over seven years. Clearly not particularly impressive. On top of that, what you will be seeing as well is that in terms of implementation, we are at the end of the sixth year of a seven-year period, in theory. Well, we are not yet very, very far advanced. And on top of it, this is the type of action which today, I am sorry to say, uh, is lagging behind other types of investments. So clearly, we are not exactly uh, at the right kind of speed, at the right kind of pace uh, to make the kind of difference which, I repeat, I think our citizens now demand with more and more, um, with more and more force. Now, this is not the whole picture, obviously, uh, because air pollution, and I assume this has already been stressed um, over uh, the past 24 hours, air pollution has to be fought in, in very different ways. It's not about, you know, these direct emissions and then, in, and then having filters and so on. It is about organizing the whole society and the, the whole economic system in a uh, more uh, sustainable way. And from that point of view, I think that um, we don't have to feel ashamed when it comes to cohesion policy because out of those 300 and something billion I mentioned, well, we do have something like 70 billion today which would, in one way or another, ultimately uh, make a difference to air pollution. If one looks at energy efficiency measures, especially uh, in the housing stock, if one looks at the support for renewables, if one looks uh, at uh, sustainable uh, transport, uh, and so on, and, and so forth. Um, let me just, still talking about the present, uh, also open one parenthesis on um, what the mayor of Bratislava has been sharing with us, in fact, implicitly. The importance of cities in, uh, in all of this. We do consider, consider that cities are actors um, which are crucial uh, and uh, which uh, need to be helped because they can make on their own already a very, very significant difference. And they can think in a system way. Basically, how is my city organized? How is my city ticking? How can I plan it overall uh, uh, in an adjusted way uh, so that um, it is good for the climate and good uh, for air quality uh, as well. Well, on this we have, uh, I think, two very um, stimulating instruments. One is called uh, Urban Innovative Actions. And I mention it because uh, we have a call which is still running. And if uh, there are city representatives in the room, uh, I would uh, encourage you to look at it because up until the 12th of December, you have the chance to introduce some, as the title suggests, innovative types of approaches uh, in order uh, to specifically uh, fight uh, air pollution. And we have seen already quite a number of very 
uh, very interesting approaches and, uh, and ideas. So, you know, some funding is still available for that and some time is also still available, a few days at least, for uh, submitting um, uh, uh, ideas of, um, of yours. Uh, and then the second uh, instrument I'd like to uh, refer to, which I think is very useful, especially for the coming decade, is one which has been developed under the so-called urban agenda for the EU. Um, under that agenda, 14 strands uh, have been uh, developed, and one of them, again, was uh, on air pollution. Uh, and the result of uh, that uh, work uh, is, I think, uh, to have a very interesting toolbox in terms of um, best advice for, for instance, um, devising at the level of cities um, clean air plans or for um, uh, approaching Yes, the financing question or the financing uh, quandary uh, in the best way possible. And this, um, these guidelines uh, have been in fact developed um, in partnership with the European uh, Investment uh, uh, Bank. So I mentioned this because again, I think that especially over the coming decade, uh, cities are essential actors in, um, in our uh, uh, in how we're reaching our goals. Now, um, let me just introduce here a second quote, uh, which is related to this uh, very unconvincing um, mobilization and, and, and dynamics which, uh, which we are seeing. And this second quote is in fact from Confucius. He said, when it is obvious that the goals cannot be reached, don't adjust the goals, adjust the action steps. And this is, I think, exactly what we will have to be obsessed with over the coming decade. Because I repeat, you know, it's easy to say, we need to be more ambitious than going to minus 40% in 2030. We need to raise the bar, go to 50 or to minus 55% even uh, in 2030. Yes, and I think well, our populations are in fact all for it. But then let's be serious about what this means. And we need to be damn serious about everything we do with the scarce money we do have, and especially the scarce public money we do have. And this leads me then to uh, the future. I think there is another, um, uh, another slide on this. Does this? Is it, oh, it's already on. Someone is taking care of me. That's great. Um, so turning to the future, the cohesion policy of the future, which in fact would cover more or less the whole of the next decade, it is meant to start in 2021, and implementation can last, according to our plans, up to two years after the last year, which is 2027. So this leads us to 2029. So we are spot on. What have we proposed? Again, 300 and something billion euros. Not exactly peanuts. Very, very serious money. On top of that, as you might know, in cohesion policy, you have an obligation for national co-financing. So it means that, you know, out of 300 billion, you have an investment capacity of closer to 500 uh, billion euros. Have we thought about the sustainability agenda? Yes, we have thought about the sustainability agenda, and we have suggested that um, a lot of the money um, under cohesion policy should go towards climate action, towards generally uh, environmental uh, quality, so fighting all types of uh, pollution, be it for uh, water uh, or, for, uh, or for air. Um, and we hope that our proposals, which ultimately add up to at least 100 billion euros being used for climate action and for, uh, and for the environment uh, together, that this will carry the day because member states 
And Slovakia is one example, I'm sorry to say, you know, are pushing back and they're saying, yeah, but we have other needs, you know, we need, we need other things, we need roads still, we need, I don't know, you know, all types of other infrastructures. And this is where um, I would really call for um, putting our money, in fact, where, where our mouth is. Let's think about Confucius and let's think about the action steps which need to be, in fact, stepped up. Uh, and it's not just the money, it is about also the quality of, um, uh, of what uh, ultimately we do. And for that purpose, we have also proposed to really show the way to the future. Like we have proposed that in future, cohesion policy could not support anymore at all any technologies linked to fossil fuels, which again, you know, brings us to some pushback by member states like, yeah, we'd still like to invest in gas, you know, different things. Uh, can't we, you know, accommodate this transition path and so on. Um, also in terms of selection uh, criteria for individual projects, we have proposed to embed um, in a way the do no harm to the environment principle that basically upfront in the selection criteria, you are not allowed to select projects which would have some um, uh, detrimental effects on the, uh, on the environment. So we hope to carry the day on all of this so that indeed cohesion policy is fully modernized and fully inscribes itself into, um, into this, uh, I would say, civilizational uh, ambition, uh, which is the one carried by the European continent uh, uh, today. To end, I'd like uh, to add one point, which is a kind of uh, new kid which will be normally coming uh, to the fore uh, still before the end of this year, and it is related to um, a very particular challenge which we will be facing in Europe and which is well known here in, uh, in Slovakia and which is um, in a way emblematic for uh, the transition which is required in order to meet our climate goals and to meet our uh, air pollution or rather air quality ambitions um, and uh, which in fact is absolutely required to change this map, right? Because we see that, especially in Central Europe, but not only, uh, basically uh, talking about um, particulate matter, uh, as the previous speaker, uh, we have a serious issue. And this notably comes through burning coal. So um, on this, uh, the, the new commission intends to uh, show clearly that we want to reconcile um, economy um, and environment, and we do not want this transition uh, to lead to uh, tragic situations uh, of, a, of a social nature, that some parts of Europe would certainly, certainly see uh, their traditional economic activities uh, disappear uh, and uh, the jobs that go with it as well and not having anything in place of that. And this is why we uh, aim to put forward a new instrument, which would be called the Just Transition Fund, and which would be targeting exactly those regions of which we today already know. In Slovakia, for instance, Horna Nitra, which is coal producing still today, and about which the government has said that uh, they want to stop subsidizing uh, these coal production activities by 2023, and that is again tomorrow, um, that in these regions of Europe, uh, we would be targeting specific public money support so that we could ensure um, a diversification of the local economy, reskilling of the workers uh, from those uh, regions and generally a regeneration uh, of uh, the uh, uh, landscape uh, there. So this is yet to come and I'd like to finish on this uh, note. I hope I was not, uh, I didn't come across as, uh, you know, too, too bleak uh, to you. In fact, I'm an, I'm an optimist. I believe that uh, Europe is waking up to the challenge uh, and that Europe will eventually, as we have shown the world is capable of doing, 
um, Europe will eventually lead the way and at the moment when it is still not too late. Thank you very much for your attention. Mark, thank you very much. So Mark is joining us uh, on the panel, and um, we're talking financing on this, this panel, uh, how funding can facilitate. Um, has, let, let me go first to the European Investment Bank. Now, many of you probably know about the Juncker Plan and how the European Investment Bank has been part of, uh, playing a major part of that in helping to finance uh, the projects across Europe that are going to boost the economy. Now, adding to that, the factor of health, of fighting poverty and boosting the economy, it would seem like a no-brainer that any kind of project that involves clean air, that addresses all those factors, would, would be the one to, to finance. Um, is there maybe more of a focus on that? Let's talk to Adina uh, Radikovsky. Adina, you are the head of the Environmental Policy Unit at the European Investment Bank where you're aiming to mainstream uh, in the environment in the investments, has it become easier for you to get these uh, clean air related projects approved and funded and financed, Adina? Uh, thank you, no. To be, uh, to be honest, the answer is no, it's not an easy task. It's but not. I will uh, start uh, actually from the EU Green Deal and just to make the link with the investments. So uh, what EU Green Deal means and how we translate it in simple words, raising ambitions and delivering to, towards this ambition. So for us, for EIB, was uh, actually uh, intense uh, internal reflection if we are, uh, because we are part of the deal, how, how, what, it does, what does it mean and how do we deliver. So, uh, and this took shape actually in a in, uh, detailed action plan that was put in place and approved by our board on 14th of November, so two weeks ago. So now we are formally the EU EIB climate, uh, EU, EU climate bank. And you've, got, you've got the blessing from Christine Lagarde, I think, too, Yes, right? yeah. yes, it's true. I call it climate always in brackets. Why? Because if you look what climate uh, bank means in reality is climate and environmental sustainability. So there are actually three, three uh, key ambitions, with meaning scaling up ambitions. First of all, it's to deliver by 2025, uh, to scale up our ambitions to 50% environment, climate and environmental sustainability actions. And this is where it comes to integrating environment into, into uh, investments. This is the first ambition. The second ambition is to raise from billions up to 20, 50 trillions of euro, of euro investments in sustainable finance. And what sustainable finance means, it's again full mainstreaming integration of climate and environmental into the uh, into the sector can you give an example of that is yes. there is there a, a project that you've been fighting for for the last several years that has not gotten funding but now you think it has a good chance of getting that funding okay so i will give an example uh, by uh, so first of all I don't like to speak about, as that's already mentioned, for, for us, climate and air pollution should be uh, considered together. By acting on climate and uh, in, uh, air pollution together, it's actually, uh, we have the opportunity to take the advantages, but also to build on the synergies between Paris Agreement and SDGs. So that strengthens so your strengthen hand in your in argument, argument saying, saying it strengthens your hand in that argument saying uh, it's not just climate, exactly. it's, it's our health it's we're exactly. talking about. It's our health we are talking about. And now coming to examples. So that's, I think that's a, that's a, a hashtag clean area you want. It's not just the climate, it's our health we're talking about. Why it's, don't we tweet that? It's true that climate is on the top of the agenda, but we have to be uh, to, to consider climate in the overall environmental sustainability objective. So it's one of the environmental sustainability objective, climate, of climate mitigation and climate adaptation. Coming to examples, so yeah. all our projects, all our projects should be environmental sustained. That means should meet our environment and social standards. We have ten environment and social standards, and each and every project should 
should go through an intense due diligence on this. And one of the, uh, the environmental, uh, sta all the standards are based on new legislation mm -hmm. and new targets. And of course, pollution, addressing air pollution, it's one of, uh, of the standards okay. we are talking about. Concretely, what's one of those projects? Okay, one of the projects I'm thinking about uh, right now. Uh, I know I'm challenging you like this, so it's not okay. easy. Okay, uh, air quality actions plan in Milan. Sorry, again? Air quality action plan in Milan. Set in, in Milan. In Milano, yes. Setting, Milano. Setting the, setting the plan, uh, supporting the city to develop the plan, and then identify the priority investments, how you address health into, and put it as a top priority, and then investing, of course. So that means, that means boosting tra public transit, getting people out of their mm -hmm. cars, getting people on bicycles. Everything. Every, and another uh, one, by the way, because we are here in, uh, in Bratislava, and uh, the mayor already mentioned, Bratislava Sustainable Urban Mobility, it's one of the, of the projects that we are financing, so it's a 246 million uh, project uh, total cost, and the IB is financing 50 million of this. Uh, okay, that's, that's European level. Can we talk locally? Let's uh, uh, talk to uh, Yeje Zan. And Yeje is vice president of the management board at BOSS, that is a uh, Polish bank, Bank Ochrony Srodowiska. Uh, I, I'm doing pretty well because my wife is Polish. So um, let's see. And, and, and you're financing uh, pro ecology and structural projects. Can you give us an example of what the private, private sector is funding? Because there has to be a profit motive in this too for the private sector to get involved, right? That's correct, Chris. Thank you for, for, for introduction. Uh, before I start, uh, uh, if I may introduce my organization, it is state-owned bank. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. uh, okay. To, to be precise, right. um, and uh, uh, talking about its name, it's uh, in English translated into uh, uh, Bank for Environment Protection. So. In this case, we are not typical banking organization, but we've got some significant focus on environment protection. So from this perspective, uh, I, I like this question, especially as we, as we are having in our minds uh, from early beginning the focus on, on uh, uh, that aspect. We are in the market already for close to 30 years. Uh, just to give you a flavor of, of our scale, we already financed uh, projects for uh, 51 billion Polish Zlotis, which I think it is it is it is uh, interesting, especially from from ecological. That's, that's about forty-five uh, million euros, right? Uh, it's no, no, no. It's around ten, no. ten something. I would I'm sorry, ten, yeah, ten. 10 billion, 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 that's right. Of course. And uh, uh, why it is uh, it is important to 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 mention it again uh, because. We are, as I said, typical. Uh, we are not typical organization. We are having this focus, and this is focus. This is not only our mission, but this is the way how we are acting in the market. Because, uh, for example, we do not have only regular relationship managers, credit officers, but we do have on our regular payroll uh, ecologists. Right. So, huh. so, uh, so even though we are thinking about introduction of new solutions, new products, it is carefully uh, analyzed by our ecologists. And in case we are talking about projects, for example, the projects are carefully evaluated uh, from uh, uh, ecological effects p p perspective. So you're saying among the boxes you got to check that qualify uh, has to be air quality in uh, there somewhere maybe not exactly air because uh, i think uh, there's still something uh, uh, to be done here right but i think we already made a significant step into this direction because because each transaction is carefully measured and analyzed from the perspective of uh, uh, environment right so those people those mentioned ecologists are evaluating those uh, transactions okay. uh, they are building support for our decision uh, bodies in our organization to support support or to not support some specific uh, uh, projects, uh, but uh, uh, this is something extraordinary, at least on, on, on Polish market, right? Can you, because can you, okay, can you, can you give us uh, specifically a project that, that matches that, uh, it that is, you've done? It is difficult to talk about, you know, names and, and uh, things like this, but maybe to give you the flavor of, of, of areas in which we are cooperating. For example, we are financing uh, uh, photovoltaic installations from okay. small uh, uh, consumer-like to large-scale uh, uh, installations where our ecologists are 
again, evaluating the impact, uh, calculating the, those uh, uh, specific uh, performance uh, uh, measures like, you know, carbon uh, uh, footprint and so on and so forth. And these so, are like low interest loans that you give uh, for this? Uh, and of course, it is it is it is, it is tightly connected. Once uh, the business is meeting our two objectives, because we of course are bankers, so we need to be focused on commercial uh, part of, of our activity. But but of course, the ecology profile of the transactions it, it is extremely important for, for for us. And once it is having the strong arguments from this end, of course, it is having the uh, impact on 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 uh, attractive pricing condition for the for, for the customers. Especially once we do. Uh, have also the possibility to, to structure the transaction to advise the customer how to build uh, uh, the business, how to use the funds that are av available on the market from external uh, sources and how to structure the approach to those uh, directions and in the end to meet all possible objectives. Uh, what I mean by this, I mean of course generate uh, uh, result uh, uh, for organization, I mean for, for the bank, generate environmental effect, right, uh, uh, which it can, be, can be measured later on and of course to give the customer uh, uh, pure benefit uh, mm -hmm. on the cost sides usually because once it is not supported by this part of, 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 of uh, you know uh, factors uh, it will not fly honestly because because the business uh, owners business customers or even retail customers are interested in, in in money in the end of the day I mean in the lowering costs of of, 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 of having those eco related uh, installations infrastructure and, and um, what, what's important in this finance thing, too, is to uh, see, to make sure that, that some projects do not defeat others, that, that there's a coherence, right, <clears throat> in what you're funding to, to bring about clean air, to cut emissions. Um, Nova Kurila, uh, State Secretary for the Ministry of Environment at, uh, of Slovakia, um, how, how do you see that? I mean, how are you able are you able to, to, to prevent some policies from contradicting others in, in your financing of projects? Yes, so first of all, a uh, very good morning to everybody. Uh, it's a great, great pleasure to participate in this distinguished uh, panel. Um, let me start by clarifying one aspect. Uh, Mark was delivering especially um, his presentation on the, on the funding part. I would like to make a clarification between funding and financing, which is quite crucial. Yes. When you talk um, about grants, we talk about the funding because it's a kind of a subsidy that is helped to trigger uh, the further investments and, and to carry out the project. However, when we talk about the financing, we mostly talk about the banks uh, or the loans or the credits that you need to repay and, and you need to actually pay back uh, what's yeah. been uh, it, ha it has to be viable absolutely right? so yeah. that's a different in slovakia we do both we do the funding we are relying very heavily on the cohesion policy because we need to you know uh converge uh, our economies we want to prosper but still we want to uh, keep the environmental integrity and climate in integrity right uh, so this is a clarification on the cohesion front. If I may start with, mm -hmm. we, as you, uh, as Mark also shown in his graph, uh, we're trying to be effective. We put, or we mobilized around 200 million euros to support um, uh, air uh, qu quality improvements projects, uh, especially uh, through the large um, uh, pollutant, uh, pollutants or large combustion uh, installations. Uh, however, we now designing a new uh, phase or new programming period where we want to be a little bit smarter uh, than we used to be. We focus on the bigger installations because they are causing uh, the bigger impact and now we need to scale down uh, to the medium size and uh, to the smallest polluters, which actually represents around 80% of overall pollutions in Slovakia. Hmm. Uh, the the so-called um, uh, fine particles, the PM10s, yep. represents 80% of pollution, so we need to address that. Again, we are relying on the cohesion policy and through innovative and effective approach. And thanks to the cooperation also with the DG Radio and our commission colleagues, we've been able to put uh, um, on table 35 million euros to replace a very old, old-fashioned um, solid um, boilers uh, for more ecological one for the transitional period, mostly for the gas. Again, from um, uh, from the cohesion policy, we mobilized. Uh, roughly uh, 50 million euros through so-called greener household schemes to support heat pumps 
photovoltaics and also biomass boilers that are also targeted to improve uh, air quality. What is actually not really working that we try to operate in the silos. We, we don't really have a constitution of a program or we don't constitute a program that actually integrate or mainstream all the, all the relevance. We talk in isolation mostly about the climate and for example in the bio biomass discussion there is a competition uh, because in terms of CO2 pollution you decrease but in terms of particular matter you, you, you actually increase your emission. Yeah. So there is a contradictory uh, policy effect at yeah, the end of the day. How do you solve that? How do you solve that on your level, national? Yeah, so you, you try to really um, do it to the best available technique standard mm -hmm. and try to eliminate as far as possible the perverse effects. So uh, the idea is uh, now to, to support, um, f let's say for the next program period, a kind of integration approach that we perhaps also get together different uh, programming uh, instruments that we have at hand in order to avoid these contradictory policies. Climate was uh, mentioned number one, but also I would mention um, energy in wider sand, transport, and industry. On industry front, if I would now talk a little bit on the, pri on the public money, not only about the cohesion money, we have put just recently in September, we adopted the new climate legislation where we put on a table around 2.5 billion euros for next decade to modernize our heavy in a, or energy intensive industries, which is huge. Yeah. It's, a, it's a huge money. Most of them, it is also made available through innovative financing, uh, mostly through the auctioning of emission revenues, which is also part of an equation that we need to be also a little bit creative. Now, does that somehow, are you able to get more funding through the European Investment Bank that way? Does that, does that Absolutely. Work? Uh, yeah. In a way, European Investment Bank is assisting us, especially the yeah. 10 uh, member states that are in you need. Yeah. Uh, mostly because the criterion is based on GDP. So mostly, let's say, lower income member states would benefit from the modernization fund. There's also another fund, innovation fund, innovation fund and EIB will be monetizing the money. Okay. I would like to also stress that we want to continue with the uh, uh, with a progressive approach and now we are also uh, we've been capable to to be successful in in so-called uh, integrated life projects because especially the awareness raising in our cities in our region is very low and not many people know that uh, the the air they breathe in the polluting valleys mostly by uh, using the old-fashioned uh, boilers they're basically uh, making a very um, uh, negative health impact in terms of uh, 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 let's say um, respiratory or um, other uh, diseases. So uh, this program, uh, this project is was just approved recently. It's worth of 15 million euros, out of which 9 million euro is a grant uh, from the European Commission. Uh, we have created a consortia with our regional and municipal authorities in order to really make it across the board in Slovakia and to help educating uh, people around it and help to navigate them towards new, uh, let's say, financing uh, or funding possibilities. No, but is, is the, the health aspect uh, a becoming a stronger argument for you in justifying? Because there's also pain here. When you're cutting, you're diverting funding from one thing to another. That could affect jobs, that could affect subsidies, right? Mm -hmm. It could, but not necessarily in this respect, because health and uh, uh, air pollution is actually uh, one, uh, to one, you it's a win -win. one size of the con. Absolutely. Yeah. This is the argument why we are bringing these instruments and tools in order to tackle the health challenge, which is for Slovakian citizens about 4,000 premature de death annually, which is a huge number. So you're able to, are you able to leverage that as an argument in what you're doing? For example, through the life integrated projects, as we see our Polish neighbors in Malopolska region, they also applied or and they were successful in, dri in driving this project. And based on the life integrated project, they mobilized extra 700 million euros that came around, especially to improve innovation part, economic, uh, let's say, side of the coin, and other elements. So through the uh, such an instrument, you can really leverage. A, uh, a very decent and very solid funding for another project that would yeah. complement the initial initial bid. Good, good. Uh, we have a question over here, please. 
Good morning. Um, my name is Veronika Antalova. I work at the Institute for Environmental Policy at the Ministry of Environment of Slovakia. Um, since you are all representatives of the public sector, I would, would like to ask um, if you have any measures that you are taking to um, attract um, private investors to invest in cleaner air, um, especially mainly um, institutional investors like pension funds, mm -hmm. for example. Thank Good you. Good question. Adina, you want to deal with that? Thank you for the question. So actually EIB is a pioneer, it's a leader in blending public funds with private, uh, private uh, uh, finance. So uh, it's, uh, I can give you a very simple example. So uh, last year we, we had uh, used 26 billion euro from the EU budget and we managed to attract 500 billion euros from the private sector to blend to this 26. So it's, a, it's an important important achievement and this was uh, this uh, this budget went to climate and environmental sustainable pro sustainability project so uh, there are a number of examples where EIB actually blends with public funds, uh, blends public funds with private, but also with funds coming from other IFIs. I can give you a few examples. The Global Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy Fund, which is called GRF. So this is focus, uh, focusing on energy efficiency and renewable. But also in addition to this, there are a number of innovative finance, uh, finance uh, instruments that the EIB put in place, which are again blending private and public funds. One, uh, one example is for ex uh, so an example it's natural capital financing facility from the from uh, uh, the European Commission so has a huge uh, air pollution component within and the second one which is a new business model and we have to we have demonstrated the viability of this is Elena which is energy efficiency and sustainable energy efficiency in buildings and sustainable transport in Europe uh, how we manage to do it, because this is important. How do you attract the private uh, private sector to blend yeah. it with the public funds? So what EIB is doing, it's actually uh, providing risk protection for the private sector. I think what you're doing is you're sort of um, taking some of that risk out of it, exactly. right? It, so, this is... on us. The risk is on us. Yeah, that's right. Yes, Marvel. I may just compliment because we have a very similar vehicle established in Slovakia uh, that supports the blend, uh, blending of the financing. It's called Slovak Investment Holding and mm -hmm. Slovak Investment Fund that is actually exactly uh, put on table uh, to, to mobilize uh, private money. Uh, it invests uh, in new breakthrough or very innovative technology. I would mention also uh, one company which was also supported through the Slovak Investment Fund but also through the EIB. It's the company Greenway which supports the e-mobility infrastructure in the Central Eastern Europe, one of the leading, uh, leading companies. And as a Slovak investment the holding was investing or putting um, or triggering the, the, the kind of the start money uh, to, to, to actually make them an, another step to be kind of a scale up, uh, let's mm. say, mm. Um, and, and to make a success. Another concrete example is the company called GA Drilling. Uh, which explores um, um, uh, drilling, actually. Uh, uh, this is another example where Slovak investment um, uh, holding was, was, was putting the money and triggered the, the, the another additional uh, private uh, funds. So I think we can, we can design uh, also some operations uh, because mm -hmm. this fund is managed by the Ministry of Finance, mostly. Uh, there are representatives and it is mobilized through EU cohesion policy uh, from uh, all um, uh, programs that are available in Slovakia. So let's try to maybe focus on the air dimension part because it would be also instrumental. Uh, Jesze, what's, what's going on in Poland with that uh, in, a, in, in encouraging uh, the boss bank in, in encouraging the private sector? I can focus. I can focus especially on, uh, uh, let's say, our commercial activities in this in this area. Especially, we are supporting commercial customers with their projects with proper funding from our side. I'm not talking about those external funds that were already mentioned by my colleagues, but but with uh, direct banking fin fi financing that is used to establish some uh, environmental friendly installations that are generating later on uh, positive effects for our commercial customers. So, from this perspective, we are. 
uh, pretty active and we are of course uh, 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 supporting projects like this. I think uh, something also to mention is uh, IFC the, on a global level, as we were, uh, uh, Olga was talking about on a global level, I think some of the, uh, getting in the private sector involved is the International Finance Corporation, which is the, uh, deals with uh, the private sector, it's the uh, arm of the World Bank. So we're seeing that on a global level and also on a European level. We have another question over here. Oh, yes, Rosamund. And uh, let's go to Rosamund first. Yes. Hello. Um, we all know Rosamund, I guess, right? From, from yesterday. Hi. Welcome, Rosamund. Oh, hello. Yes. Um, Mr. Johnson is currently on the radio in the United K Kingdom, so forgive me. I've told them that I'm going to be ringing in. Um, my daughter, <laughs> don't laugh, I mean it. My he's, he's, not, he's not a block of ice this time. That's no, melting. he's not. He's there. My, I was told by an expert that without the illegal levels of air pollution in the UK, my daughter would still be alive for today. I would like to ask um, the um, Director General that I notice you're going to make your standards even stricter. What And the people in the United Kingdom are very concerned. We never get to hear people like yourself. What question do you think is appropriate for me to ask Mr. Johnson in the next few minutes oh. over the standards? Uh, because he's telling the United Kingdom that we are going to be leaving at the end of of January and we are very concerned about the standards because the UK have never met the EU standards so he's on the radio right now what question do you believe is appropriate to let the United Kingdom know about the standards the UK yeah. claim they're going to be adopting please can you make that question any more loaded <laughs> He has lots That's of time. That's really political. He has lots of time. <laughs> Does anyone want to deal with that hot potato <laughs> and not get too political and not get involved in, the, in, in this upcoming election? Good luck, Mark. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, heard, I heard Director General, so I guess it's difficult to, to escape, even though they are... Uh, you know, I'm not the only Director General of the European Commission, and in fact, it is, it is, it is my, my, my colleague and friend Daniel Callejo, uh, whom you know much better than me, and who will be, in fact, concluding also yes, this, good luck, uh, Daniel. Uh, this, this forum, who, who is driving on, on, on the standards and on the policy side. But um, Obviously, we w without uh, wanting to intrude in any way uh, into, um, into the UK campaign, uh, certainly the standards we have set collectively with 28 member states at EU level have been set because we believe in their absolute necessity. And their absolute necessity from the point of view, first of all, of the health of our citizens. So, um, on this, just like on social standards, you know, the UK has always had some issues with minimum social norms, standards, which have been set at EU level. That you cannot work, for instance, for more than 48 hours per week, according to your contract. Well, some people in the UK don't like that. Okay. Uh, well, our hope, of course, is that in the future, with the UK as our neighbor, our closest neighbor, uh, we will continue to be able to have a very strong partnership with the UK and that the UK will choose of its own will, in fact, to adhere at least to some basic EU standards of the type I have mentioned, be it uh, specifically on the environment uh, and related to health matters, obviously, or on uh, social norms, and again, it is also related to, uh, to health in that case. Was that okay for you, Rosamund? Okay. Yeah, let's, Olga, please, Olga. Just very shortly. Get, uh, go ahead and stand up uh, so we can okay. see you. Uh, as UNEC, where I'm coming from, is one of the five the United Nations Economic Regional Commissions, so we are for Europe. Uh, I want just to assure you that the question is very relevant and, uh, and, and uh, makes sense. Uh, the parliamentarians from the United Kingdom are already visiting us in Geneva and discussing the things on 
after Brexit situation, not only environmental issues, there will be trade facilitation, uh, you know, cross-border movement of the goods, but we are working hand in hand with the European Union and uh, those, you know, those issues are already raising questions. They are coming to us for advice. I was just speaking about our air, air convention in the whole region about the protocol. So this is the way for the UK uh, if the Brexit, Brexit will really happen. Okay. <laughs> Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you, Olga. That might be worth a, a hashtag clean air EU there. That's, that, that sounds like news to me. Um, thank you that they're talking the après Brexit with UNESE. Um, we have a question here from one of our usual suspects. <laughs> thank you. My name is Daniel Leszynski and coming Hi, from Daniel. Center for Sustainable Alternatives. This is NGO based here in Slovakia. I have two questions to Mr. Mark for DJ Radio and one, que one question to all panelists. So, first, cohesion policy. No, I, no could do long. I mean, I don't want a long shopping list. Give me one question. And then you can come back later. We've got another 20 minutes. Okay, just to introduce. Uh, so, I represent Slovak NGOs in three programs in cohesion policy, in monitoring uh, committees, and also in, uh, in committee preparing new uh, cohesion policy in Slovakia. How to make the cohesion policy really green? In the past, and also the past we live today, uh, we have in cohesion policy so-called uh, horizontal principle for sustainable development. This horizontal principle is a great systematic tool, but two years back, I was looking for a responsible person at DG Radio, then also at DG Envy, competent and responsible person for this horizontal principle. This horizontal principle should save that any investment will not uh, damage the environment. And after half a year, I found nobody, nobody responsible and competent for this horizontal principle. And therefore, the horizontal principle have been taken as a formality. And this is not green approach for future. So is that the so question? first question? Yeah. Will you please restart the horizontal principle for sustainable development that it's really working tool at any uh, EU members state who taking the cohesion policy? Can I go further for questions? Okay, one more, but that's it. Yes. Okay, one more for, for all panelists. We have green public procurement. And we as NGOs kindly ask you that public money is spent only through green public procurement. The green public procurement we know more than 10 years. We have standards based already in all Europe. It's still uh, just voluntary tool and therefore is also not used or just used formally in country of Central and Eastern Europe. So will you apply green public procurement as a must for all public money in a green deal period? Thank you. And this is question is also for other panelists. Thank you. Sure, let's, let's go to Norbert first, I guess. Norbert, can um, you wave the magic wand and um, make this happen? <laughs> I thought that maybe Mark would start uh, because uh, it was uh, there was a person that was um, uh, Daniel looking for at DG Regio or uh, DG Envy, uh, but I must um, say that uh, I agree um, in principle that it's very hard also for the Slovak authorities to kind to kind of uh, find a silver bullet for sustainable development that would. Um, um, influence in a positive way all the um, all the programs that are drawn uh, it's not an easy task um, uh, i hope that for the for the next program period which starts actually um, tomorrow uh, by 2021 we can do it better and provided that the financing will be will be again or the funding will be again robust enough to cover and in an integrated way all the needs we have um, on the green public procurement if i if i may uh, 
uh, okay. jump directly. Uh, we have committed um, our ministry, which I represent here today, but also government, to go uh, more actively uh, for uh, for this voluntary approach. We have been working together with our pub, um, um, public uh, tendering authority, uh, which uh, oversees all the procurements. Uh, in Slovakia and we've been working on the methodology how to make it um, crystal clear how mm -hmm. to make it implementable and also at the end how to make it binding um, uh, so that's the that's maybe um, uh, a solution uh, that we try to not only commit ourselves uh, at the ministry but also make it to across the board for example we have started already with three main categories uh, transport the vehicles we have already uh, some e-fleet uh, available okay. we started also with the IT uh, and uh, and then the, the third uh, category is the paper so all these three categories being uh, procured uh, through through green public procurement at least at the ministry I hope we can go beyond and make it at the government level and also widely at the regional municipal level as well uh, Adina please I will jump to the public procurement green public to allow Mark and Daniel to reflect better on uh, on the answer to the sustainable uh, development uh, uh, horizontal part. So uh, in EIB we have a guide to procurement and the guide to procurement is mandatory for all our um, for the um, all our uh, projects that uh, EIB is putting money on and uh, that means for uh, goods services and works and we have a covenant in this uh, in this uh, public procurement guide that we use it, which, which is called Environment and Social Covenantum, that it's mandatory to be used by our, by our clients when, uh, when we speak about EIB funding. Um, <clears throat> we have less than 10 minutes, unfortunately. Uh, did you, Mark, do you want to add something first? Go ahead. Well, briefly, yeah, because, because I guess it was, um, it, it was addressed to me uh, first. But frankly, um, let's start by uh, recognizing all that when it comes to cohesion policy implementation, who is responsible first? It's all the member states. It is not the Commission. Uh, the Commission tries to set up the most stringent rules possible when it comes to the, the subject matters of our concern. And I have mentioned them to you, you know, in my introductory statement. Um, for instance, by banning, you know, all fossil fuel related, um, related projects, but more specifically um, in project selection in the future, that there would be a permanent rule indeed of no environmental harm, that this would be a constant criterion to select projects. And I shared with you that member states today do not agree. We have made that proposal for the future. They contest it. They try to erase these environmental uh, criteria. Now, this is the reality uh, we are facing. Uh, as regards the present period, you are saying that uh, there's no one to speak to. Uh, well, the, uh, the reality of this is that the present framework is very imperfect. Very imperfect because what you call these horizontal principles, um, we checked these at the start of the period and then the rules say, and if the member states at some point at the start of the period, you know, tick the box and have what is uh, required, that's it. And then no one looks at it again. And this is exactly why we want to change the rules uh, for, um, for the future. Can I abuse for a second? Quickly, and, quickly, because I got and just five come minutes. back, co come back to, to to two issues. The first one is about uh, de facto getting the private sector in, and de facto about loans versus subsidies, grants, and so on. We push as much as we can in the direction of mobilizing the private sector because ultimately they will have to do the heavy lifting on everything. But at the same time, we need to recognize that not all projects ultimately are bankable, even with you know, some subsidized uh, loans and so on. Uh, and I give you one very concrete example, and it's a very interesting one, uh, which is from Poland. Hmm. And there you were, you were spot on, Chris. Hmm. In some parts of Europe, the climate agenda can be um, convincing to people 
through the angle of air quality. And this is exactly what has happened okay. in Poland. You know, Poland oh. said, oh yeah, well, fine, your climate agenda and so on, but, you know, we have 80% of our electricity which comes from coal, uh, and we need to develop, and we need to catch up with the rest of Europe. So, you mm -hmm. know, your climate agenda can wait. But then, within Poland, well, concerns grew Over health. regarding, exactly, yeah. through health, yeah. regarding uh, air pollution. And here, one point. If we think about households in Poland who are today, and we have that phenomenon also still in Slovakia, uh, using uh, heating boilers uh, and putting in there sometimes not even low quality coal, sometimes their household waste. Well, for these people, uh, you know, a bank loan will not do. These uh, the transformation of these boilers into something sustainable um, uh, will have to pass necessarily uh, through very significant public uh, support. And it is absolutely essential to make, uh, to make that kind of change. So, you know, we, we need to be discerning on um, exactly what approach we take. And for instance, in Slovakia, we are very happy because the Slovak government is indeed looking at loans wherever, you know, loans suffice and, uh, and, and subsidies are not, uh, are not necessary. Um, let me add uh, another question here before we uh, approach our end is that, um, for instance, this uh, so-called Juncker plan, the uh, FC, the European Fund for Strategic Investments, that it has one of these guidelines that about 30 to 30, well, it, it, no, the, uh, the effect is that 30 to 35 percent of the funding had some air quality co-benefits. Um, do you think that's enough? Should it be more? Should it be binding? Adina. Yes, EIB is actually implementing the Juncker plan and 30-35% uh, uh, is achievable. We already demonstrated that uh, we can do it. But, and uh, I think we can uh, uh, scale up our, our ambitions. And for this reason, 50% was included in uh, EIBS uh, EU Climate Bank. But related to Juncker plan, because I will move to the future, which is invest EU, and uh, in addition to this, the sustainable, sustainable finance uh, package uh, uh, regulation that is now uh, on uh, on the Commission uh, uh, table. So, uh, what is this about? This is about there are three elements that uh, are absolutely important. A unified classification system to clarify what is actually climate and environmental action. And then this should be combined with do not significant harm. So we cannot address one environmental objective and forget and have significant harm on other environmental objective. And the third element of this point is uh, uh, achieving minimum social standard. And if you think what minimum social standards are, so are human rights, labor standards, human health and safety. So health is a key indicator health. in this. And in also when you speak about taxonomy, the six environmental objectives, one relates to uh, pollution reduction, which address uh, air pollution. Uh, okay. Before ending, I will just want in this, uh, in this space to add one more point, which is very important in this package. You have the green um, bond standards, EU green bond standards, okay. but, uh, what we want to set up. And I think because we speak about about finance, the, bro the bonds are actually, it's a market with huge potential. We have 800 billions already rich as green bonds, but the overall mar market is about 100 trillion. So for out of 100 trillion, only 800 billion is it's, uh, it's green bonds. Therefore, it's another instrument that can be, uh, should be used. And these green standards for uh, uh, green bond standards, it's an important issue for EIB, EIB being actually the pioneer, the first one to issue in 2007 the first green bonds, and in, 2000, uh, in 2017 the first sustainability bond in the world. So uh, actually we explore this market and I think it's a huge potential. I think well, uh, if we can comment briefly on, on this last thing is that how do you try to make sure that when you're financing a project that it promotes energy efficiency and air quality how difficult is that to make it work? 
And isn't that extremely important to make it work good? Jerzy, can you talk about that in Poland, how they're trying to shift away from dirty heating, for instance? Sure, Chris. Uh, we do not have much time, I guess, so I will yeah. do my One minute, best to be, to, be, to, to, to be quick. So, first of all, we should solve this problem twofold. First of all, we should address financing to the areas where it is needed. and the where the purpose of the financing is uh, um, supporting the clean air uh, especially. What I mean by this, I mean the exchange of obsolete uh, installation, uh, connection to the district heatings, uh, photovoltaic installations, and so on and so, and so on. So from this perspective, we should manage carefully what we are financing. And we as a bank at least are having a clear agenda what is important for us and uh, where we can be sure that the uh, finances provide provided by us are strongly supporting the, the environmental effect. From the other perspective, we are the bank. Okay, so so we need to monitor, we need to measure everything. I've already mentioned the ecologist role in our uh, in our bank. So so ah. again, so again, uh, they are involved from the beginning. But uh, later on, once we've got also the transactions up and running, of course, we are observing the effect uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, during the time of the of the of the financing uh, projects. And uh, of course, we are not doing it only by ourselves, we are, but we are publishing this information information in the form of annual ecological report to the market, right? So, so everyone can see, for example, what is the uh, uh, um, carbon footprint of uh, some installations, products uh, that are uh, both for retail and, and commercial customers. Okay. I mean, it's, uh, that, that figure that I saw just shocked me about uh, in Poland with, uh, that uh, of the 400,000 <clears throat> 400, premature deaths, 44,000 are in, in Poland. That's, that makes a very, very strong argument for any kind of project that you're financing there. Um, thank you so much for the panel. Let's give them a big hand. <laughs> I, see, I see a couple more questions. We, well, let's, let's take a coffee break. We have one more panel where we're talking quo vadis, and I'm sure we can integrate that question into it. We'll see you in a half an hour uh, after a coffee break. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you could please take your seats. We're running a little bit behind time, uh, but, and we know where the people have trains and planes to catch. Let us begin. Reflections and concluding debate, Quo Vadis Air Quality Policy. We've talked about the issue, we've talked about the solutions, the financing, where do we go now? Why don't we talk to the Finnish rotating presidency, presidency of the European Union, uh, and uh, representing the Finns is Tethi Letonen, State Secretary of the Ministry of Environment, Republic of Finland. Uh, you were also, before that, DG Climate Action, and you were a Greens member of the European Parliament. Please, Tethi. Appa uh, yes, applause. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I will just correct one thing. I wasn't a member of the European Parliament, but I was, I was in the European Parliament for, as oh. a green stuffer for, for a long time. It's true. Sure. So distinguished colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very honored to be given the opportunity to speak to you today on behalf of the Finnish presidency on the topic of clean air, which is of such key importance to the well-being of our citizen and the environment. I would like to also congratulate the European Commission and the Government of Slovak Republic for putting together, uh, putting forward such an impressive ag agenda and for bringing us all together. Although emissions of air pollutants have declined, almost 20% of the EU's urban population lives in areas with concentrations of air pollutants above at least one of the EU air quality standards. Exposure to fine particulate matter is responsible for around 400,000 premature deaths in Europe every year, and Central and Eastern Europe, European countries are disproportionately affected, as we have heard. The case for more action and more ambition on tackling air pollution is clear. It is supported by science, economics, and popular opinion. The current EU standards are not ambitious enough to be generally health science-based, and do not adequately protect the citizen. This is especially true for the fine particulate matter standard. 
At the same time, we know that, if, that many, if not most, member states are not able to meet the current air quality standards. So what has held us back until now? While the challenge with air quality is shared, the nature of the challenges differ across member states. In Finland, air quality is generally good, and, in, in almost, and almost all air, EU air quality limit values are met. Nevertheless, air pollution causes 1,600 premature deaths every year, as well as other ill health, and contributes to eutrophication. Significant health benefits and savings in terms of societal costs could be made by reducing air pollution also below the current air quality thresholds. Finland benefits from being a sparsely populated country with fewer emission sources than most member states. Another factor contributing to good air quality is that most buildings in urban areas are supplied with district heating. Still, European air quality standards helped to put the spotlight on se the seasonal poor air quality and local hotspots and motivated policy measures which have also proven to be effective. For example, the use of studded tires and winter sanding of roads used to cause high concentrations of PM10, particularly during the spring season. The city of Helsinki, together with the neighboring cities, have taken decisive action to tackle road dust, inter alia by road maintenance, street cleaning, um, EU-funded LIFE project was an important part of this effort and also helped distribute information and good practice. So targets matter, and locally tailored measures can also be very effective. As particular emission sources like inland shipping, manure application or biomass heating are more relevant for some regions than for others, it could be tempting to conclude further action should be tailored to the local conditions and taken at the local or member state level. In reality, however, especially for industrial installations and production traded on the EU market, it has proven very difficult to set more stringent norms on the basis of local, and local air quality challenges. Leaving further air quality ambition solely to national or subnational level also ignore, ignores the long ranges many of these pollutants travel, not to mention the principle of equal protection of citizens and the environment across the EU. We also know from the experience of many European cities that struggle with exceedances of NOx emissions that for vehicle pollution, a failure to address the emissions at EU level leaves local actors with very few and very unattractive options. The technologies for significant reductions of vehicle NOx emissions have been available for more than 15 years and their application in new cars put on the market was in fact required by the European vehicle standard and put, that was put in legislation in 2007. But as regulators, we failed to put in place the necessary controls for ensuring sufficient equipment was installed and operating in the normal use of the vehicles instead of just the laboratory test cycle. So EU product standards matter, but only if they are capturing the potential and are meaningfully enforced. Ladies and gentlemen, while the environmental challenges today are daunting, some of the measures offer significant win-win potential. One of the key priorities of the Finnish presidency of the EU has been to advance the glo EU's global leadership on climate action. This includes advancing the process to reach a common agreement on the main elements of the EU's long-term climate strategy before the end of the year, as requ requested by the European Council that is committing to climate neutrality by 2050. The Finnish government itself has decided on an ambitious goal on climate protection, namely to be climate neutral by 2035 and climate positive soon after that. This will be achieved by accelerating emission reductions and stre strengthening uh, carbon sinks in the short and long term. The good news is that a truly one and a half degree compatible climate policy would solve much of the air pollutant emissions especially if we assume that also international shipping and traffic are decarbonized. As a rule of thumb, reducing fossil energy consumption also reduces emissions. The faster we decarbonize, the higher the savings from avoided investments in the end of pipe technologies. The one important exception being replacing fossil fuels with wood combustion. Another piece of very good news clean air news is that the global shipping sulfur limit of 0.5% uh, enters into force 1st of January 2020. This will contribute significantly to reduce sulfur dioxide emissions and therefore also secondary 
fine particulates globally and in the European Union. And we can draw further inspiration from the 35 large cities from across the globe, but also from Europe, that signed the C40 Clean Air Cities Declaration just recently in Copenhagen. The signatories pledge to set ambitious pollution reduction targets that meet or exceed national co commitments with the aim to meeting World Health Organization guidelines. With new technologies and digital tools, we can also empower the citizen to be more aware and active in their own environment. A project in Helsinki, also partly funded through EU Urban Innovative Actions Programme that was already mentioned by uh, Marc Lemaitre earlier, is testing the collection of new high-resolution, re hyper-local air quality data and making it available to citizens in real time, coupled with some microfinance to encour encourage community action and individual behavioral change. While there are sectors that merit further air quality standard setting at the EU level, like agriculture, residential and biomass combustion, and indoor air quality, and while the implementation of best available techniques in permitting has scope for improvement, in the next five years, the EU must find a way to tackle the systemic sustainability challenge. The systemic nature of Europe's climate and environmental challenges was also underlined by the Environment Council in its October conclusions, calling for fully seizing the opportunities for co-benefits and synergies between different environmental policies, including those addressing climate, nature and biodiversity, air quality and healthy living environment, water resources and the circular economy. Colleagues, I think many of us share the opinion that the new Commission President Ursula von der Leyen's plans for a European Green Deal and her program in general has been a very welcome injection of energy and ambition to EU environmental policy agenda. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you again for allowing me to take the podium this morning and I'm as eager as any of you to hear the guidance of our distinguished panel on the way ahead for clean air for all Europeans. Teddy, stay where you are. One, one thing, just want to ask you. Sure. Uh, we, we were talking a little bit during coffee, and, and you know, this idea of, of getting the public to care about this. And, and one aspect is um, a Finn who has a sauna in the middle of nowhere, how do you persuade them to go electric? How do you do that? Ooh, that? That's terribly difficult. I think we can erase that from the record. I think this you can't do. This you can't do. But I think what we can do, what we can do, is we can advise um, our our population. Actually, that is already happening. Uh, to burn uh, the the use dry woods in their saunas. And actually, there's quite some difference between sauna stoves. Some of them emit more uh, particulate matter and some less. And okay. there, so so we could start by labeling and giving some maybe some traffic uh, signs on, on which ones are good. And, and honestly, we have to tackle this also for the fact of black carbon and, and yep. uh, it's air quality, it's, it's climate, it's, it's uh, something we ha have to be. Because on that air quality index that I saw, that map, Finland's in there with some dark colors. I saw. Oh, I'm sure there was a wrong map. Yeah. <laughs> right? So, okay. Anyway, we all have work to do, right? Thank you. Thank you, Thank Jenny. You. Thank you very much. Okay. Let's... Time's a ticking. Let's call up our last panel, please. Our final panel on Quo Vadis. Where do we go from here? And as you've heard from uh, Tedhi, the, uh, there's, there's plenty more work to do. As, we're, as they're taking their seats, can we put up those slides on the uh, Eurobarometer? We we're talking about, you know, the, the, the Vox Pop on all this. How do we... And this forum is part of this. How do we help to change hearts and minds with what we're saying here these, over these two days? And, and how are those hearts and minds uh, before this forum? Um, this is a Eurobarometer index. Uh, now, most pro Europeans say they lack information um, about, about clean air, about air quality. Um, but 31% have heard of EU air quality standards. So there is an awareness. We got to build on that, obviously. Um, next slide. 63%, about two thirds 
of Europeans say they are, these uh, standards are not adequate and should be strengthened. And then, of course, you had also tying that then to the climate thing where you had the European Parliament that is the elected body of the European Union uh, saying that there is a climate emergency. So there, there is public support for more action. So, Daniel, where do we go from here? As Daniel Calleja, Director General, DG Environment, European Commission. Daniel, please. Thank you very much. And let me start by saying how pleased I am to be here in this very important forum. And you were rightly saying, Chris, how important the air quality issues have become. It is true citizens say we lack information, but at the same time they say we are concerned. We know this is an issue. And this has not happened by chance. This is the result of the fact that increasingly citizens are concerned about their, way, their quality of life. Citizens want their cities to be clean. Citizens want sustainable transport, sustainable energy. And we have been working a lot with the cities, with the states, with the civil society to pass the message that it is not acceptable to have 400,000 premature deaths in Europe linked to air quality issues. It is not acceptable from a human perspective, but it is not acceptable neither from an economic perspective. It is not acceptable. I think that is a hashtag clean air EU. Okay. Let's tweet it. Yeah. So the topic of this panel is where do we go from here? What can we do? Because citizens are saying what you are doing is not enough. And they are also saying we want action. We are tired of words. We want action. What the Commission has been doing over the past two years is conducting a fitness check. And yesterday, we published online, yesterday night, the conclusions of this fitness check. And it's not all great. You guys have been making, prepar making progress, but it's, 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 it there's is, a bit of um, mea culpa in here or self-criticism. It, is, it, it right? is light and shadows. So okay. I, we have come out after these two years of analysis with hundreds of consultations, with several workshops, examining studies, looking at data, looking at the overall impact. Is our legislation fit to deal with this problem? We have come to seven conclusions, okay. which you have on the slide. The first is that increasingly air pollution is increased, not, is linked not, so, not only to the environment, but also to health. This is a conclusion that is obvious, but it comes very clearly from all the respondents to the consultation. The second is that in spite of the problems, yes, in Europe, we are making progress. The air quality uh, situation has improved over the past years. Not completely. We have still 130 cities which yep. are exceeding mm -hmm. the standards. But when you look at the situation we had in the year 2000, we have seen progress, partial progress, but progress. So we see also that our legislation, although not enough, has been delivering partial results. Third, we say, how do we deal with this problem? Are air standards the right way? The conclusion is, yes, they have been working. We need to continue the standards. It would be wrong to relax them, to show compliance, but it would be wrong to look at other objectives which are not measurable. We need to continue having EU standards and two out of three Europeans say the EU should even do more. Even do more. Perhaps adopt the WHO standards, as we've been talking earlier, right? This is the third conclusion. Yep. Current standards are less ambitious mm -hmm. than scientific advice. Mm -hmm. So the issue is, should we move now to the WHO standards? This is something that the Commission is seriously considering in the framework of the Green Deal, to which... I will also mention. Because even what we saw yesterday, even those WHO standards in some ways are not even that's enough. Exactly. And I think we need to go increasingly for science-based legislation. So if the science makes recommendations, it's very difficult for yeah. the political authorities not to consider. So we will have to discuss with the member states and with the European Parliament, what do we do about the standards? And should we align the standards with the WHO recommended values. Right. Then 
We think that limit values are more effective than other type of standards. We need to be concrete. We need to have limits. We need to see if there are exceedances to monitor the situation. Legal enforcement works. It's not just a slap on the hands. It actually works. It works because, first of all, it has increased the awareness. Yep. Second, because countries are obliged to take this seriously. France just got it from the European Court of Justice. We have we see what happens. We have, we have also the possibility, if countries do not comply with the judgments, to go even for fines. Mm -hmm. So this is not the only remedy. We also need to discuss financing, support, awareness, but it's an effective tool, which we will continue. Then we need to further harmonize, monitor, data, and measure, because it's very important, the monitoring, and we will have to do more. And finally, we are also coming to the conclusion that we should go more for e-reporting. We have a lot of satellite measurement, which is more effective than receiving the reports for the member states. All these issues are going to be very carefully scrutinized in the framework of the European Green Deal, which President von der Leyen has announced. Within the Green Deal, which is a comprehensive and systemic approach, and which she has announced to be presented in her first 100 days of office. Mm -hmm. One of the most important parts of the Green Deal is this zero pollution ambition. Besides the climate, besides the circular economy, it's how do we improve the situation on air, on water quality, on chemicals. Is it possible in Europe to lead the way towards this zero pollution ambition, to improve the quality of life of our citizens, and to guarantee that environment and health go together. Okay, this all sounds great. Why don't we do this? There must be barriers. Um, what are these barriers that are keeping us from taking action? Uh, Felipe Araujo, uh, who is vice mayor of the city and city councillor for innovation and environment of Porto, Portugal. Well, uh, you're also chair of the Euro Cities Environment Forum. Um, what are the barriers, uh, let's say, on a local level? Let's start on a local level. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here, especially in, the, in this topic that is a, a difficult topic. Clean air has always uh, been a, a very difficult topic. Uh, when we talk about air pollution, and several times we are mentioning the, the, the number of premature deaths that uh, causes, but uh, uh, usually if you talk to a citizen, he is more concerned, for example, with uh, car accidents. He, he thinks it, it, people die more from car accidents than this type of things, and uh, they, it's 10 times uh, more than uh, road accidents uh, killing people. So th this is a type of, uh, of thematic that, uh, area that we are in that's not, not easy for sure. Um, I think what, what, what's going on, and it's that uh, cities have been doing a lot in this topic. They understand uh, really the, that everything is connected. So when you are talking about energy or when you are talking about climate adaptation or something and the measures that they are taking, they know that they, in, they, the, the air is a very important topic because you will not uh, for sure uh, notice. It's not something visible, but for managing, we understand that if you have a lot of traffic, you are causing problems there. So in the, in the, in the way the politician has a, um, although probably the citizens are not really aware, we know that we are causing problems to these people. So we need to, to address it. So there, in the decarbonize, uh, decarbonization of the, the energy systems of uh, uh, cleaning with the leading, I, I heard the, the mayor of Bratislava saying that we must lead by example. So cities must give the example. They, they, if we want things to change, we have to start by our own home. So cities, cities are changing their car fleets. They are showing that it's possible to have electrical fleets, for example. Um, they are investing in nature-based solutions, for example. There is a lot of, of new solutions uh, coming out in cities, um, retrofitting the, the buses, so there is a lot going on. But of course, we are talking about a very transversal problem, a transboundary uh, in nature. So uh, we need the help uh, from everyone. So it's not a matter of what the cities can do by itself. They are doing a lot. Uh, but it's a matter of working with the EU Commission, with the, with the national governments on all these topics. Uh, you have to, to take care in climate, in transport, in agriculture, all sorts of pollution. So there is a lot that we, we need to do on, on, that, on that matter. 
Uh, Felipe, we, we saw that your barometer report showing strong public support mm -hmm. uh, for, for more action. H how do you feel that on the city level in Porto? Do you, do you, do you feel that or is there some, also some reluctance or, or, or are there barriers there to, to changing things? Well, definitely. Uh, well, I'm 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 working. Uh, I came from the private sector. I'm working at the public sector. Let's say for the last uh, six years. Uh, what I've noticed is that six years ago, there was the awareness was completely different. Mm. So we are in a totally different time. Uh, things have changed a lot. I would say in the last two three years, they changed. In a, uh, the the pace has increased a lot. So people are now aware that uh, they have to do something in order to preserve their health, uh, which is more visible than the, the air or, uh, or something. So they are starting to understand that probably the problems that they face in their daily lives with their children, mm -hmm. with their uh, going to the hospital or something are caused by, by these things. So the, the awareness, I think, is, is coming and it's helping a lot. And we, we have seen in the, in the European election what, what uh, mm -hmm. this was really a concern. Uh, even in, in countries uh, like Portugal, where uh, there, there was no so, uh, uh, there is not so much this concern in the in the society, it's increasing a lot. So there is I, definitely there is awareness. So we have to take advantage of it and and uh, show people that we have a common strategy on all levels to to tackle this. What about on a, on a national level? Uh, Gertrud uh, Zala, Director General, German Environment Ministry, responsible for. Emission control and, and you dealt with a diesel gate scandal of a few years ago. You've been with the ministry for about 25 years. You must have seen that evolution. How do you break through these barriers? And there are, of course, very strong financial interests that, that prevent trying to do more and faster, even though Germany has been seen as, as being at the forefront of a lot of the, uh, of the uh, uh, reform like this. Yes, um, that, that's true. Um, I believe that uh, on an EU level, we approved uh, ambitious requirements uh, regarding the abatement of air pollution. Mm -hmm. But of course, um, uh, requirements are, are the one um, um, side. On the other side, we have to take action. Yep. And as air pollution is a cross-cutting issue, especially uh, sectors like agriculture, industry, um, energy, and so on have to take action. And that's um, the problem because we have on the EU level, but of course also very, uh, on, on the national level, very strong lobby groups. Oh, okay. And the diesel scandal is one of, um, of the, the, the good examples how um, this um, works. Uh, we know about um, the problem minimum since 10 or 11 years and um, we needed minimum six years uh, to approve an, on, on the EU level the real driving emissions uh, directive. So that shows us that uh, if we want really to achieve our goals in air pollution, but also in other sectors, we, we must find a way to limit the uh, lobby um, influence on a European and on a national level. Well, at the, um, the Eurobarometer survey, for instance, the vote in the European Parliament, does that strengthen your hand on the, on the national level at your ministry to be more aggressive about cutting emissions? I <laughs> or are you still facing this strong resistance from, from yes, I, financial interests? Yes, we, we made a, a very interesting experience in the last months. We had this Friday for Future movement when young people went every Friday on, on the streets and um, demonstrated for more action uh, re, um, uh, debating uh, climate change. And this was the beginning of a stronger public awareness, hmm. especially, of course, on, on the climate uh, um, um, issue. But I believe uh, that that will help us also to raise awareness for environmental questions as a whole. Uh, but um, 
when um, when we uh, yes and 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 this uh, movement was was something like the starting point for the German government mm -hmm. to um, uh, to uh, adopt uh, legislation regarding uh, climate uh, climate adaptation and mitigation. But um, my uh, observation is that there is still uh, a lot of reluctance, especially in the traffic sec sector from, the, from our Ministry for, for Traffic Affairs. There is reluctance uh, in the agriculture sector and, and, and others. So we, we started, but we have a long way to go forward if we want to, uh, if we really want to achieve our goals. Okay. Um, I, could I call up, uh, please, the State Secretary for uh, the Agriculture Ministry of Slovakia, uh, Gabriel uh, Cicai, please. Welcome. And, uh, Minister, can I speak English to you? Is that okay? I will speak Slovak. But you will speak Slovak, but I will. Okay. All right. Um, I guess maybe the same question to you uh, about public support for doing more when we, as we look to the future. Uh, how much is that public support from what we saw of the Eurobarometer survey showing two thirds of Europeans want to see more done to cut emissions uh, in the European Union? Can you comment on that? There's also this issue of trying to get different ministries. You're from the agriculture ministry. And you've got an environment ministry, you've got an industry ministry. How can you get all those ministries to work together and not against each other in their own silos uh, in trying to solve this emissions problem and making cleaner air? Minister, please. Thank you for this question. I personally think that as far as uh, cooperation between individual, individual ministries in Slovakia is concerned and in the European Union as such, I don't see this uh, as problematic. I believe that the ministries see the need to bring down the environmental burden, especially in the area of air pollution. What is, however, still problematic is to find a way how to put this into practice. When we are talking about agriculture and agricultural production, the farmers are seen as the bad boys, as the unfound terrible. As regards ammonia, I have to say it's true, more than 60% of ammonia is uh, owing to agricultural production, is due to the agricultural production, but there are certain linkages, uh, certain given things which cannot be s sorted out overnight. On the other hand, uh, we have uh, the citizens of the EU and uh, to whom we promised uh, cheap and healthy food. The number of citizens in the EU is not decreasing, on the other hand it's growing. Uh, the demands in terms of life quality and standards are growing as well, so we are consuming more. Uh, we see people uh, switching to vegetarian, vegetarianism, uh, but not, not that many actually, so we see that meat production still has to be secured. I saw a while ago that the ambitions of the EU as concerns ammonia and overall is to bring down the numbers to, to zero uh, eventually. I can tell you that ammonia is never going to drop down to zero. When you have uh, livestock and uh, when you have uh, meat production, you will never achieve uh, zero. I believe that the way to go is to find uh, technology, innovative form, how to make sure that the ammonia that is generated can be somehow utilized and not to let it uh, be active as, as, as a pollutant. So the production is here to remain, here to stay. We have to find a technology that will ensure that uh, the air pollution effect is not going to be so 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 great, so big. We know that the larger uh, the holding of the farm, the easier that is. Uh, we know that the smaller holdings have problems with that. The greater the burden, this is what we are somehow struggling with here in Slovakia and also uh, countries in the Central and Eastern Europe. I heard from a colleague just a while ago that, that Germany has certain problems with that as well, especially with farms from the former socialist bloc. 
We have to nevertheless realize that certain production patterns cannot be ignored. Uh, the menu, uh, we, we will have that from the, from the livestock and the ammonia content is not going to change. But the question remains, uh, what kind of methodology are we going to, uh, to somehow adopt uh, to capture the ammonia that is emitted? Uh, this is where I somehow see a space for cooperation between individual or across the ministries. And the unions should also focus more on innovative ways of fostering research and innovation in this regard uh, we see the biofuel uh, examples so this is a slightly different category i admit uh, but still uh, the main large production uh, actually is a source of uh, food so so not much to hold against that uh, but i still see major economic potential how to use the ammonia that is generated or any other pollutants uh, for that matter and to make that somehow profitable and to improve the situation in agriculture and to further bring down the costs do you see a you obviously see a way to break these silos down and to work between the different ministries to make this happen for instance re regarding ammonia right you do okay uh, uh, Daniel on, on, on the European level this this is probably a big challenge too is that yes maybe perhaps this this euro barometer strengthens your hand uh, but you've got to deal with other DGs in making this happen mm -hmm. uh, I think that's the intent of this this green deal is to make the the, the different uh, uh, directorates work together how big a challenge is that gonna be well it's a very big challenge and I have put on the screen mm -hmm. a slide which shows something that our colleagues were saying. Everything is interconnected. We will not succeed if we do not have a systemic approach. And this is what the Green Deal tries to do. We have to look at the various initiatives, at the various challenges that we have. We want to fight climate change. For that, we need an agenda of decarbonizing Europe, being the first region we total with to be climate neutral by 2050. We need to fight against pollution, and this requires looking at the water we drink, at the air quality. It, it looks it needs it needs looking at the chemical sector, industrial emissions. This is the zero pollution ambition. We have the farm to fork initiative. How do we? achieve the challenges. How do we overhaul the common agricultural policy? Which how, is, how, do we reform, we how do we reform it to make it sustainable? How do we ensure safe, affordable food from our citizens throughout the value chain? Mm -hmm. How do we improve the way we produce? We have the circular economy. How do we make our economy move from this linear way of produce, consume, and throw away uh, to a more efficient resource uh, economy and we need to integrate all these elements all this is a cross-cutting strategy and we need to use tools and we have a certain number of tools we have regulation we have enforcement we have innovation which is a very important tool because there will be innovative solutions coming from technology for the future and we need to integrate all the actors because this will not happen if the citizens don't support behavioral change, and if we don't work with the cities, with the countries, with the farmers, with the various mm -hmm. uh, levels of the society. Yeah. This huge challenge is what the Green Deal tries to encompass. That, that we're, hopefully we're all going to benefit from this, but we all have to bear the burden, right? We have to bear the burden, but I also want to say there is an opportunity. There's a huge yeah. opportunity if we go in this direction. Because this is not only about the burden, this is about building the society and the economy of the future. It's about improving the quality of life. It's about uh, developing new sectors or new kinds of business, right? If Europe is able to lead in this area, we will have the first mover advantage. Yeah. We will be the first region in the world to move in this area. We will be developing the technologies of the future. And we will be offering also our companies, our citizens, better possibilities and what i have to say is that we have no chance we have no other better alter there's no other alternative when yeah. you look at the figures of consumption of depletion of of, of, of uh, natural resources 
of climate change, I have not mentioned the biodiversity crisis mm -hmm. we are facing, mm -hmm. if we don't go in this direction, the planet will go on, There's but we will not be able to survive in this yeah. planet. So we need to move and we need to lead the world in this challenge. No planet B. Uh, I have only 15 minutes left before we have final comments. So let's go to the questions, please. Yes. Simon. Simon Burkett, uh, Clean Air in London. Uh, I'd like to thank you for a great couple of days, and I very much hope that the UK remains uh, part of the Green New Deal and doesn't leave. Uh, but we will see. Uh, Boris Johnson is certainly famous for wanting his cake and eat it. Um, I would ask uh, two things. Uh, first is that you are very strict with the UK um, during any um, further withdrawal agreement arrangements, but also in any trade deal. Please do insist on obligations to match any rights that the UK demands, because otherwise the whole um, uh, system collapses. And I would just give you one example, which is very apposite given the fitness check today which is that in the withdrawal agreement for the UK, it refers to commitments to ceilings and targets, guess what, not limit values. Uh, and I think that's a very striking omission. And uh, I would encourage you all to um, please be as tough as possible with the UK. I think everyone in Europe will benefit. Thank you. That's more of a... Well, I can, I can only echo what uh, the chief negotiator of the EU, Michel Barnier, was saying a few days ago. We have the withdrawal agreement, but we have to negotiate the future relationship with the UK. And of course, regulatory convergence is very important because we need a level playing field. We will not be able to negotiate market access in a trade agreement if we don't have a level playing field. So this will be one of the critical elements of the negotiation. Environmental, product, safety, health standards are going to be very important. We hope that we will continue cooperating well with the UK, but it will be very difficult to, have, uh, to reach an agreement, a trade agreement, if we don't address these issues. And we need a level playing field in our relationship with our British friends. Test. Here we go. Test, test, test. I think this is working. Hi. Yeah. So uh, I'm from Slovakia. Again, Andre. I have a very fast question. As you surely know, we have still large deforestation in Slovakia. The citizens are very unhappy about it. So how the European Commission will help the member states to control and regulate the continual deforestation because we are speaking about clean air, about low emissions, but uh, we have here the nature of filters and we are killing them. And that's the responsibility also of Slovak Republic and the government. So please, how you will act. Thank you. Uh, maybe Gabriel first, would you like to comment on that, answer that? Ah, neviem, kde by som vám aj začať. Osobne si myslím, že to je trošku... Personally think that this is one-sided view. Uh, the deforestation in Slovakia is not that huge. And you have to look at the numbers. Roughly, if we take uh, those 9 million cubic meters, this is even less than 1% of wood extraction per year. And I know that I'm not popular with the greens, but you know, uh, each tree has its life cycle. You plant a tree, the tree grows, it's got the production value, and the, then the tree grows old. And uh, many of our forests that were planted years ago have reached the end of the light cycle which is 100 120 years so at the end of the day at the end of that cycle we need to uh, uh, you know make the best out of the value which is left there of course replanting is important along with deforestation but if you look at the average life cycle of a tree 100 years and we say it's one percent only uh, I would say that in the worst, worst case scenario, the number of trees in Slovakia is exactly the same as 50 years ago. 
Of course, there are natural disasters, blizzards, and you know other situations which uh, kill trees. And uh, the forests in Slovakia are not controlled by the state. Uh, there are state forests, of course, but you know vast majority of forests are controlled by uh, by private by the private sector, and it's difficult to convince the private owner of a forest to uh, or not to do something. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, during the last cabinet session, took a decision to allocate huge amounts of funds from the profits of the state forest company to forestation. What we want to make sure is that we keep the balance and that the total area of forest is not diminishing. Yes, there are one-off disasters, but... Uh, Yes, we, we want to keep this brief, and, and, and this is a real, obviously a polemic in the country that needs to be addressed. Um, Daniel, could you address this very briefly because I've got like yeah. four or five questions out here I want to get I, to. I, wi I will not comment about the forests in Slovakia, but I would like to bring the, <laughs> the, glo the European perspective and the global perspective. And I think uh, one very important challenge we have is uh, to use all the instruments in the fight against climate change. And of course, forests play an important role. They are natural sinks and uh, active and intelligent forest policy is very important. As part of the Green Deal, in the first 100 days, the European Commission is going to propose a very ambitious biodiversity strategy, which will have two parts. We will propose measures at EU level in order to preserve, to protect, to restore, and to mainstream biodiversity across all policies. But I also want to mention that we also have a responsibility in Europe in deforestation in third countries when we consume products which come from the forested uh, areas. So we have a big uh, challenge next year, at the end, in one year's time, in November 2020, in China, in Kunming, we will have the Convention on Biodiversity. The IG targets are expiring, the targets for biodiversity, and we need a global agreement. And we will not succeed in fighting climate change if we do not have an ambitious biodiversity strategy, because they are the two sides of the same coin. The, the lungs of the earth. Yeah. So we need nature-based solutions, and we need to work more in this area. Okay, um, I have so many questions. I want to take three of them. Um, who's got next? I think, yes, you. And uh, my, my. And then these two over here. Okay, please. One after the other. Yeah. Okay, Sophie from Heal uh, Health and Environment Alliance. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for publishing those, uh, those uh, conclusions. Very much uh, appreciated, uh, very timely as well. And I have a plea to all representatives of member states in this room. Please don't waste any time and do your job, which is to protect the health of citizens all across the EU. And if the Commission was to propose something that we expect is going to be bold and ambitious, please support it, because without you, nothing is possible. And without you, everything is possible. Okay, next uh, question statement, please, over here. Please. Oh my gosh, oh, you got a mic. Okay, go ahead, go ahead. Very brief, okay? And we're looking forward. This is the Quo Vadis panel, okay? As brief as I can. My name is Janina Turcano. I represent Greenpeace Central in Eastern Europe, and my question goes to Mr. Crespo. In the context of the legal campaigning work that Greenpeace has been doing in the region in partnership with other NGOs, one of the main obstacles we have come across is the issue of exceptions or derogations. So I was pleased with the seven lessons that Mr. Crespo introduced us to, and I know they refer to air quality ambient directives primarily, but I would like to know if the Commission is considering the issue of exceptions, because by way of example, the Industrial Emissions Directive entered into force in 2016, and nevertheless, the derogations extend until as far as 2024, and the worst is yet to come in the form of the timeless uh, derogations that uh, we expect operators to ask to the implementation of uh, best available technology conclusions. And of course, thank you so much for the forward-looking, uh, inspiring uh, talks during these two days. Thank you so much for your comment. Who's next? Yes, please. 
Hi, Mike Holland. Uh, I'm a consultant doing a lot of cost benefit analysis. Hold for the mic closer to the mic mouth. Yes, good. It's, it's working. Just close yeah, okay. Um, but brief, please. Yeah, brief. My, my question is, uh, are we pretending that this is much more difficult than it is? If I look at uh, East Germany after reunification, managed to get rid of uh, solid fuel burning in the home within a few years. If I look at the uh, action on, uh, draconian action, as you may call it, on uh, anti-smoking now, people have accepted that. People have taken that behavioral change uh, on board, despite the fact we're dealing with something that is an actual clinical addiction. So I think behavioral change is easier. I think that the, uh, solving the heating issue certainly is, uh, is easier. Are we making this too hard? It's changing, it's changing hearts and minds. Yes, please. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'd like to come back to the point you said about the science. Could you the... identify yourself, please? First? Hello? Your, your name and title and yeah, serial Yeah, sorry, number? Chris Bucock from Eris Europe. We're uh, quality policy consultants. Okay. I would like to come back to the point you made about the science. And in that regard, I would like to ask your opinion on what would you do in the situation where science is contradictory? For example, we have the global sulfur cap mentioned. Now, my understanding of the science of that is that potentially removing sulfur from shipping is going to cause global warming increase. And on the air quality side, there are benefits to be had. So science can be on these two issues, providing different directions. And my question is, how will you choose to balance between the two? Thank you. Okay, next, uh, please. Yes, right here. I'll take as many as I can for the next three minutes. Yes. Thank you. I'm Margrita Tolotto. I work for the European Environmental Bureau, Federation of NGO. A little, a little slower and enunciate, yes. please. Margarita Tolotto, EEB. Oh, and what is the organization? With European Environmental Bureau, Federation Environmental. of NGOs. Oh, okay. All right. okay. I have a question. Uh, under the National Emission Ceilings Directive, member states had obligation to deliver their National Air Pollution Control Program by the 1st April 2019. And 10 member states did not yet deliver it. It clearly shows a lack of implementation again. And my question is, what are the commission plans? And is it probably time for infringement action? OK, that's a good question. Um, that'll make Daniel sweat. OK. Thank you. I work uh, for the Committee of Regions. Uh, we have recently uh, done a consultation in the framework of a regional labs project asking to a group of apps uh, about the last cleaner forum. At least uh, one, more or less one third of them has either participated or used the materials. And this uh, consultation will be used for our new opinion on air quality. My question is, how do you think that this cleaner forum and the future ones uh, could better involve uh, uh, local regional authorities and uh, could uh, involve the uh, authorities in the forum or its follow-up. Okay, next question, please. Valerio Paolini from the, it's working. From the National Research Council of Italy. Do you foresee in the next decade uh, some specific policy on emerging pollutants, for example, for endocrine disrupting substances, which, is, which are a very important health concern? Thanks in advance. Okay, and final question over here, I believe, final question. Thank you. It's because I cut you off in the last question. Dino Leshinsky, Center for Sustainable Alternatives from Slovak, non-Orthodox uh, non vegetarian. I have a question to all panelists, double question, but short. First, what will you do at personal level to pollute air less? And second question, what will you do at your professional level that no one euro spent from public money will pollute air quality. Thank you. Very nice questions, all of them. Um, only so much time to do that. You can uh, pick and choose. Uh, but Daniel, I think you've been put on the spot about infringement. Yeah. When are you going to go after these guys? Yeah. I have a lot of uh, <coughs> questions, but I will reply very clearly, telegraphically. Okay. First of all, uh, I could not agree more with the statement that exceptions and derogations may have place in certain pieces of EU law, but certainly they are very difficult to justify in air quality, because it means that we have citizens with double standards. If we grant derogations on air quality, it means that we are accepting that the health of citizens will be worse in certain countries than others. Yep. This is why we need as much as possible full harmonized rules in this area. And if there ever is an exception which you may have for an industrial installation, 
It should be always very strict, narrowly construed, and time limited, and always subject to objective justification. But as a matter of principle, in air quality, we need to have uniform rules because we need the same standards for all the citizens wherever they live. In terms of infringements, if countries do not comply with their obligations under EU law, the Commission, following the legal procedure, has to act, and we will require that if countries have not communicated, and it's true, that there are some who did not comply. When? Well, when? We, as soon as possible, as we, we act okay. immediately. We send a letter to the countries. The countries have one month to react. If this is not so going process. well, we do the yeah. letter of uh, formal. We have to follow the, yeah. the procedures. But what I want to uh, reassure you is that we are not going to uh, be lenient in enforcement because this is our role. I tell my colleagues this is included in our salary. We are the guardian of the treaties. So when a country does not comply, they know that they are exposed to legal action. Then there was a question on the... You don't have to answer all okay. of them. Yeah, let's just pass it over. Yes. <laughs> Go ahead, Felipe. Very, very fast. First of all, uh, two or three things that I, uh, from, from your questions. First of all, we have really to, to address the gaps that we have in several uh, areas, that uh, not the most common ones, in shipping, in tire, breakwear, everywhere. So there is a lot still to, to do on that. Um, there, I agree with you, the, the, the question about the science and what we, we, we need to do and to cope. And we have made some decisions in the past that were not so very good. We are incentivizing diesel cars for some, uh, some years ago. So we understand that we, it, it was not the right decision. You have to put everything in the, and, and the decision between climate, energy, air quality has all to come together and to, to understand what is the best way. So there is a lot uh, of discussions on, on this and the, the decarbonization of the energy sector puts a lot of pressure on this type of decisions. We have to take the science uh, and, and uh, have the best decisions. On the transport, there were also uh, several things that uh, didn't went uh, very well. The diesel gate we, we heard before, it's, uh, it's very important. I, I, I hope that we learn something and that we are not put in the second-hand cars uh, moving from one European country to another European country. I, ho I hope we, we manage to do that. Um, there is a, the, the governance of the air quality is also a very important issue that we have. We have I think the Green Deal can, can help on this, also put it in, a, in, a, in the governance that uh, everyone is uh, um, at the same level and can help. But especially for the UK, uh, use the cities. Uh, we we uh, have shown in the past that we want to move fast that uh, the Euro cities has shown several position papers that we want to move fast, that the cities can have this power, this, create this awareness and can push this at national levels. I think bringing together and, uh, and uh, uh, the cities can help for sure, um, um, not only with the urban agenda that we have been participating and delivering to the European Commission, but with other projects that, for example, EuroCities is driving right now with the European Commission, connecting directly the cities to um, the Commission and uh, hopefully uh, that we can um, help uh, to have the member states uh, at, uh, uh, and the national governments moving at the same pace. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay, what will I do on, my, on a personal level? My biggest next investment will be to buy a, an electric car. Mm -hmm. And on um, um, uh, on the professional level, or on, you on have a professional yeah. uh, level, uh, Germany is one of the countries that delivered a national air pollution control program to the uh, European Commission, and our focus in the next years will be to achieve the goals in this uh, program. Okay, uh, Gabriel, any further comments, please? As for the fourth question, I would like to say that in the professional and uh, personal levels, we have to educate people. Uh, the more people understand the connections, the links between air pollution and technologies, then uh, the more people will be able to produce even better technologies and the ordinary people who enjoy these benefits will better understand uh, the 
things that are going on in ordinary life. I do not want to go back to the situation uh, that we had 30 years ago, but I will say we have to educate, educate, educate people. Yeah, it's a matter of winning hearts and minds to do what you want to do. Um, Felipe, please. Personal and uh, and uh, because I, I think it's a very good question. So it's uh, it's uh, first of all uh, two things: uh, use public transport with all my family. Uh, I think that's an important topic that we have to change dramatically the way that we move around uh, in cities, especially if we want dense cities for various reasons, and to buy local food, biologic local food. It's also important. Uh, in the met and my concern uh, as a, as a deputy mayor uh, uh, was to transform the public transport again, lowering the taf tariffs. Right now in Porto, you pay 30 euros or 40 if you want a metropolitan area in all types of transport per month, and uh, it's free for children up to 15 years old. So that's what the change that just happened a few months ago. Daniel, final word to wrap up. I want to cover because there were two or three questions I didn't mention. Sure. First of all, there was our colleague saying solutions exist. Why it's not so difficult? Why don't we put them in place? I could not agree more. This is a matter of political will. And there, even sometimes when problems seem very, very big, if you have the political will, if you mobilize the financing, if you put in place the strategy, it can be done. So I think we need to keep the challenge, but also mobilize all the solutions. What do we do if science is contradictory? Well, first of all, we try to clarify it. We have the Joint Research Center. We have some of the best experts in the world dealing with these issues. But we also have scientific committees. And we also need to address new challenges. Endocrine disruptors. The Commission is actively working on a strategy on endocrine disruptors. Mm. Uh, when I come back to Brussels, we will be discussing the drinking water directive. And we have there an opportunity to include some pollutants, which we know are affecting the health, so that we can have effective action. So this is something that we need to do. Role of the regions, crucial. And I think we need to find ways so that they are more associated, like the cities, to the conclusions of the Clean Air Forum. Finally, what, uh, we'll do, what I will do at a personal level, I am all already doing it. I have an electric car. I have a bicycle, which was offered to my colleagues when I moved to DG Environment. Bravo. I can cycle to the office. And I think the public transport commitment is very important. Professionally, I think in the Commission, we have to do more. We have put in place a system to reduce waste, to reduce, to recycle more. This is circular economy. To reduce pollution. I think one of the priorities has to be green public procurement. To lead by the example and to encourage professionally that public bodies go in this direction. And I have to tell you, I'm very happy to see glass bottles here. In the Commission, we said we cannot launch a plastic strategy and have plastic bottles. So we have now eliminated plastic bottles and we are going for more sustainable. So there's a lot, and I thank you for this question, because there's a lot that we can do, each of us individually, when you look at the issue and you start taking personal commitments. There's more possibility to do teleconferencing, for instance, instead of having to fly so much, right? Yes but, but, yes, but we still want to come to Bratislava to discuss with you. Well, there are certain uh, things we need to do. Um, I think that's great. A, guy, uh, a big hand to our panel, our final panel on Quo Vadis. <coughs> and finally, some concluding comments. I'd like to invite uh, Igor Chishmek, who is Assistant Minister for Climate Activities sustainable development and protection of air, soil, and from light pollution. How do you fit that on your business card? Ministry of Environment and Energy, Croatia. Thank Please. You. Thank you. For, <clears throat> yeah. Thank you for, uh, uh, well, for the beginning, uh, I want to say a few words of welcome. Dear state secretaries, mayors, and vice mayors, distinguished colleagues, in the panel, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to begin by saying what an honor it is to have been given the opportunity to address you at the closing of this high-level debate on the direction, direction of the air quality policy in the EU. I would also like to thank the Slovak Republic and the European Commission for organizing the second edition of the Clean Air Forum. So, I will not sum up 
the very fruitful and successful discussion we have just been part of. Nevertheless, having followed the debate, I wish to stress the need to improve the coherence of air quality governance and the environmental governance in general. It places before us, the Member States, a challenge to ensure effective actions with which uh, to implement EU legislation at the national, regional and local level. It also requires us to improve cooperation between different competent authorities. In other words, to break the silo approach between the different sectors, such as agriculture, energy, industry, transport, as key sectors that need to do more, aiming to provide an integrated response. In this context, it is important to stress the role of investments. Further steps are necessary with regard to the amount and the model of financing that should be focused on innovative and green solutions. Croatia, my country, welcomes including of air protection high in the EU agenda with the aim of realizing a green and healthy Europe for all its citizens. Although air quality has improved across Europe over the past decades as a result of reduction in emission of air pollutions, pollutants, sorry, further and multi-scale action are still required. And therefore, speaking in the role of the incoming presidency of the Council of the EU, our plan is to prepare and facilitate the Council's response on the important aspects of the air quality policy in the European Union. Uh, it will address not only the results of the comprehensive evaluation done under the fitness check of the relevant air quality legislation, but also the future of the air quality policies, taking into account the inputs from the announced European Green Deal. Over the coming months, we will engage in finding a compromise with compromise view on the issues that are sensitive to many member states with regard to the way forward, the means of challenges to improve air quality in Europe. The discussion at the forum have been very valuable and the main results will be given due consideration in our work. We find that it is the right moment for political guidelines of the Council and its member states of these topics. It, in particular, pending the negotiations on the multi-annual financial framework for the next seven years. Uh, it should also provide a valuable input for the preparation of a zero pollution ambition strategy, an important part of the European Green Deal. Some of the questions to be considered are the issue of compliance with the current air quality standards and the need to take into account the scientific evidence. Second one, mainstreaming of the air quality objectives into other sectorial policies, such as transport, energy, agriculture, as discussed yesterday. Uh, third one, financing opportunities for the implementation of cost effective air quality measures and how to improve availability of funds dedicated directly for the air quality improvement in the next programming period. And fourth one, question of further improvement, the air quality assessment and monitoring could, could also be considered. Our planning is both ambitious and realistic and we can't count count on the constructive and cooperative approach of member states, giving the opportunity to take into account the different situations. These include challenges in tackling local accidents aimed at improving health in cities in line with the air quality policies 
and cost-effective multi-scale air quality strategies and efficiency measures. To conclude, we should also bear in mind the need to improve further the quality of air we breathe to the benefit of our citizens. And uh, to quote Mr. Vela, uh, we cannot continue without change. So, for the transformation to take place, we need the green transition, uh, which is also just alignment of other sectoral policies with air quality objectives, as well as changes in our lifestyle and of choices we make as consumers. So, thank you and welcome to Croatia. Second, wait one second. I know that uh, Croatia yes. is the latest is the latest to join. It's a, you're a new a newbie to yes. the EU. Yes. And, uh, and, and, a, and a, an event like this has to show to Croatians yes. that this is a good thing to be part of the EU. It's absolutely good. How how much does this help to strengthen your efforts uh, in Croatia? to bring about cleaner air, that to show them that there's a payback on this? Well, uh, we are almost six years members of uh, EU community, so uh, all our efforts uh, is in a way to be one of uh, uh, good quality members of uh, EU. So, uh, uh, now we are we start uh, we start to uh, be uh, sorry for my english no that's, that's okay. okay no that's all right uh, you're you're, you're trying hard to comply with yes. these different eu regulations mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. many many people maybe in your country might think why am i doing this this is costing money this is of a sacrifice course. of course you have to communicate the payback right Yes, we must communicate with, with our people. It is a long, it's not a trip, it's a journey, long journey to to better future. So we must uh, push the wheel uh, together. Yes. And all, only, always together. I think this is a message to That's a lot a of the... To all of, thank to you. All of uh, to, uh, thank you for support. Yes, exactly. Yes, exactly. And That's as it. Daniel was uh, talking about as That's well, it. that this is... Good morning. Yes. Very good. Thank, thank you. Nice again. Thank you. Very good. Because having this event here in this part of Europe is, I think, uh, important to help to win hearts and minds to make this uh, mission to uh, bring about cleaner air in Europe uh, a success. Um, some final comments. We're going to call back up Norbert Karila, uh, State Secretary for the Ministry of Environment uh, of Slovakia. You are also Vice Chair of the OECD Green Action Task Force. And uh, we first met at the Paris Clean Air Forum in 2017. So, uh, Norbert, this has been a continuous effort and the effort goes on. If you can look uh, forward too for us, please. Absolutely. And thank you very much indeed uh, for a great uh, two days. Uh, but not only uh, these two days, because we devoted the full week uh, in Bratislava and Slovakia to air quality and especially air quality improvements. But I will start with the Cleaner Forum, which I consider the most impactful and most, uh, let's say, prestigious forum in Europe, where we are capable to get together uh, through joint undertaking with the European Commission, especially uh, DG Environment and others, a very representative uh, group of people, more than 500 people participated. So thank you very much for coming over to Bratislava. Uh, we know that um, those outcomes would be featuring, uh, I hope, in a qualitative and quantitative terms in new, in new uh, commission's agenda. We know that the Green Deal is coming. We heard that it's maybe coming even before the end of this year, and we hope to translate all the dynamic, all the, all the discussions, all the, the best practices, and all what we have learned from each other towards these new initiatives, and make sure that also our region, uh, I represent Slovakia, but I speak uh, more widely on behalf of all Central and Eastern European countries, 
that our concerns, our, uh, our ideas are well reflected in, um, in the overall framework which we uh, would support uh, very much. Especially um, very happy that this meeting took, took place, as you, Chris, said, uh, after Paris uh, here in Bratislava. Uh, I think it is very important that we create the momentum for, for better awareness raising because not so many people, uh, I spoke to several journalists over, over two days, are even aware uh, how a silent killer is making um, uh, problems in our region, but not only in our region, but also, also in Europe and more widely in all over the world. So very happy that we hosted uh, this forum, especially in our region, and we targeted on uh, four key areas, health, agriculture, domestic heating, and financing. So we hope that all these elements will be translated further. As I said, we will communicate uh, these outcomes already in the upcoming Environment Councils, which will take place on the 19th of December in Brussels. Uh, together with our Finnish friends, uh, we will try to convey the message uh, from Bratislava uh, Cleaner Forum uh, to other member states, to other EU institutions and other stakeholders they care, and try to um, um, make the case for very swift and concrete actions, uh, because there are so much needed um, uh, not only in Slovakia, but also in Europe and beyond. Lastly, let me congratulate and thank uh, both teams, uh, be it uh, DG Environment, especially and in personally to uh, Veronica, Francois, uh, Michael and Thomas. So uh, give a hand of applause to them. And and also, and also to the Slovak team, which was facilitating all the preparations. Uh, I don't know whether you know, uh, but those kind of meetings uh, are being prepared for almost two years, one and a half years, which is a continued uh, big effort. So, here, let, here. Me, so let me, let me yeah. congratulate okay, in sir. person uh, to, to Barbara, Zuzana, and another Zuzana, and Andre from my team for great work. So big hand of applause. Yeah. <laughs> So I hope you really enjoy this forum. We will try to uh, be very concrete also in Brussels policy making, but also domestically, because those actions need to be taken, uh, as we said, where, where the source of pollution is. So thank you very much. I hope you will visit Bratislava once again, and thank you once again. All the best. Thank you, Norbert. <clears throat> thank you for being such a great host. Why don't we also uh, thank all of the speakers, uh, including those here. Please, let's give a big hand to the speakers. <laughs> Great speaker as well. And the interpreters, big hand to the interpreters. And remember to give up your headsets before you leave. But before you give them up, I've got two closing thoughts. We also have a reception afterward. Two closing thoughts. One, I, I grew up with Jacques Cousteau. And Jacques Cousteau, even way back, said, water and air, the two essential fluids on which all life depends, have become global garbage cans. So this mission has been for a long time running, and we have much more to go, obviously. And why? Robert Redford, actor. I think the environment should be put in the category of our national security. Defense of our resources is just as important as defense abroad. Otherwise, what is there to defend? Let's defend it together. Thank you very much. <laughs>